you to start including youth at all decision making at all government levels. I want you to pay more than lip services and politics to the issues of climate change. This is my future. My future. My future. In our planet. Dear leaders. Dear leaders. Dear leaders. Dear leaders. The climate crisis threatens our future and our planet. I want you to step up policies for forests, people, economy. I want you to decide now, implement and enforce policies that are needed for a sustainable future. It is your turn to support, encourage and ensure key policies towards moving to renewable energy in Africa. I want you to help farmers, food producers and food companies to make a food system which contributes to a better world. I want you to discuss robust climate finance mechanisms, especially on climate adaptation and mitigation, given the severe impacts climate change has in our societies. Leaders, it's your turn. I want you to start including youth at all decision making at all government levels. I want you to pay more than lip services and politics to the issues of climate change. This is my future. My future. My future. In our planet. Let's everyone find their seats. We're getting ready to get started. I'll just give it a second for our last few stragglers. How's everybody doing? Is that that hunger <laughs> is sated now? How's everybody doing? This person right here gets a prize. That's you. <laughs> he had the best time in the SDG action zone at lunch. <laughs> All righty. See, it's true, right? Um, I deeply appreciate uh, you guys showing up for us. Um, the day has been amazing so far. I hope you had time to wander outside and to see all the wonderful things that have been happening, I don't know that I've ever seen people lying out on the lawn at the UN. So it is a great day for me, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, and we've got an even more exciting afternoon ahead of us, um, if that's possible, if you can imagine that. First things first, how many people in here posted at some point today? All right, we're at a solid like 75%. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. Um, if you have not posted, and even if you have, let's do it some more. Our hashtags, again, you'll see them on all the screens. Hashtag climate action, youth summit climate action. Um, we're happy if you mentioned that as well. Hashtag youth 2030. And feel free to tweet out that at UN Web TV uh, link as well so that people can follow us on the live stream. Speaking of the live stream, hello, live stream audience. Let's give them a big hello. <laughs> Um, we are super, super, super excited to just about all the engagement that we're already seeing. And if you haven't followed the hashtag, you should because awesome things are happening. Make sure to also tag at UN and at UN Youth Envoy um, so they can hear you. So with that, let's get uh, right back in. Our next session focuses on Reboot the Earth, a global hackathon that served as a platform to develop tech-based solutions to solve climate change. Reboot the Earth was launched by the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, together with the UN Office of Information and Technology, supported by SAP and Deloitte. And it was born as a response to the UN Secretary General's call for climate action, a call that young people answered with incredible, innovative ideas. Yes, of course, because we've been seeing that all day. And now we're about, meet, about to meet some of them, eight young people from across the world representing their winning teams who've answered real-life climate challenges in their country using technology. Get ready. I want a huge ovation for these guys. Please welcome this year's Climate Reboot Troops.
right. All right, can you hear me? Awesome. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, us climate troopers are here to solve the problem. The climate emergency is coming closer and closer. It's causing more and more damage. And we decided to use technology to solve this problem. Young people are not afraid of using the powers that we have being a technological generation. Ladies and gentlemen, in my country, we have a problem. Now, I love the forest. I love the plants. I love the trees. I think they're great. And many people rely on them for their livelihoods. The problem we have is unsustainable farming, unsustainable agriculture. So what I did was I developed a blockchain software, a blockchain tool, a blockchain app, an entire ecosystem that allows a decentralized marketplace to prosper, open trading between smallholders and manufacturers on a network that is completely decentralized. And I did it to solve the Sustainable Development Goals 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. I believe that we can do what it takes to save the Earth, and if we have devices that have more power than what took us to the moon in our pockets, we can reboot the Earth. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Madhvatya Sood, and I'm representing the youth of India. And I'm here to empower the women to make them warriors in the fight against climate change. Before I begin with my solution, let me give you a brief background about India. Half our population is dependent on agriculture as a main source of livelihood, and six out of ten farmers are women. It's obvious that if we make small changes in this sector, we can realize a huge impact. But how do we do that? So the solution that we developed is a three-pronged solution that we call the 3S solution, namely sensitize, support, and sustain. In order to make an impact, we first need to raise awareness about what climate change is. Through our e-learning platform, we sensitize these women about what climate change is and how it affects them. We support them by giving them the tools that they need to make informed and smart decisions about agricultural practices. And then we sustain this whole ecosystem by connecting them to people like you and me, passionate people living in your urban areas who want to do their bit through a crowdfunding plat platform backed by blockchain. We are here to make women the torchbearers, the front runners in the fight against climate change, and we won't stop anything, at anything less. Thank you. Climate change affects everyone, and so technology should not be exclusive. Climate change solutions should be accessible to everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Luar Adwan, and I'm representing the Egyptian team and the continent of Africa. In Egypt, we use, mo we use more than 85% of our water in irrigation, and our agricultural sector is suffering from water stress. And with the climate change knocking on our doors, our water demand is expected to increase drastically over the coming years, leaving us no other option but to implement new irrigation and farming methods. As a climate tribute troops, we came up with a tech solution that helps farmers rationalize their water consumption and protect their crops. GB are over-equipped with, with sensors and machine learning algorithms that maneuver the fields, collecting data about the soil moisture and the plant's temperature. These data are sent to the farmer through a mobile application that communicates the essential information and recommendations, allowing the farmer to predict changes and take the effective actions. With G beetle, small and large farms can now secure higher yield with less water. Climate change consequences affects everyone. So let's make the solution available for everyone. Let's reboot our Earth. So now, actually, it's not enough to just reduce emission. We need to remove the CO2 out of the atmosphere in order to limit increased warming and to reach net zero emission by 2050. And to achieve that collectively, the global net zero emission, we need something impactful. I'm Kim from Finland, and our team have a solution called carbon CO2 or for good in French. It takes advantage of direct air capture technology to extract CO2 from the air. The, the technology itself is rapidly developing nowadays and also dropping in cost. So by installing these extractors, devices into public transportation, it will filter the surrounding air by harnessing the movement of the vehicles 
and then all the CO2 will be collected at one centralized place for further processing. We can make the whole cycle of carbon more sustainable by processing CO2 at solar plants or windmill, or converting the final carbon into fuels to get rid of fossil fuels, or even into materials and food. And we ask government and countries to support this process with regulations and tax system in order to transform the economy into a net zero economy. I believe we young people want the humankind to take control ownership of the carbon cycle again together with Mother Earth. Thank you. We women have lost uh, our connection. Our connection with our planet, the animals and, planets, and plants living here, and our connection between ourselves. Mainly, the connection between governments and citizens. My name is Bernard Non Vaturi, and I'm an AI research engineer, innovator, and musician. I'm originally from uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, and now living with my amazing wife, Dilia, in Hamburg, Germany. And I'm also representing my team from Germany. Have you ever felt helpless when faced with all the needs that need to be done in order to stop the imminent threats of the climate crisis. While governments are abundant in funding and the sorry, analytical capabilities, they suffer from deficiency in accurate real-time data in the scale of a citizen. On the other hand, citizens and NGOs have a lot of knowledge about what's happening in their community, but they have no way to share this information or enough funding or analytic tools to use that to gain insights. What our platform is made in Deadpool is taking a solution and it bridges between those two communities and so engage communities to share and collect the information, share that with governments and help use the insight to treat those communities better. We are the cause, we are the, the solution. We are the power to make a change. We must unite in love and act now. To Daraba, Dan Kishen, thank you. We all know that in the next 50 years, our children would face the Earth's most catastrophic events, that the Earth might even be our temporary home. So let me ask you, who should take responsibility for this? Hi, my name is Arushi Agarwal, and I'm here to share a solution of a better home with you. During the hackathon, I developed iBloom, an app that connects community and like local authorities and other members by keeping them up to date on greenhouse gas emissions. But on greenhouse gas emissions. We do this through a CO2 analyzer that uses infrared absorption and that to measure the concentration of gas. Pretty effective, right? And after that, local authorities and businesses through the app can give incentives to anyone that decides to donate money or go out and plant trees. Now, I am proud to announce myself as a running founder of nonprofit Unknown 16, an organization that has and will continue to support the SDGs through STEM and programming. It is also the organization behind iBloom. And I have come here to ask for your support for my vision of Code for Cause. And despite just being 15 years old, I am standing here in front of you asking you, if not me, then who? Now let me repeat that. If not us, then who? A famous quote by Travis Manion. Thank you. A very good afternoon to everybody. I'm Harshita Murthy from India. I am the winner of the visualization challenge. I represent the strong-willed, determined women of the world. So, what can we actually, as an individual, do about climate change? My solution revolves around this. It is a platform in which women all over the world can connect to each other. But how is it different from any other social media? That's the catch. It connects you to other people based on your location. It identifies your geographic location and then gives the suggestions and uh, steps that you can take against climate change. For example, if I'm a woman from a coastal region, I definitely need to know how to swim. 
but 60% of the women in coastal regions do not know how to swim, including me. So we, this app would connect people around the region and create a self-help group and connect it to a further uh, swimming coach so that they can all learn how to swim. Moving on to an urban place like New York, what can women in New York do about sustainability? We can switch from menstrual cups we can switch to menstrual cups from tampons and sanitary napkins. Now moving on to another place, an agricultural geographic. So in this area, women can be taught about sustainable agriculture and how to implement it. When efforts from these multiple regions are integrated, it creates a mesmerizing effect. We need to do our bit for a better tomorrow. We may not be the CEOs in the government, but we can be the definite potential citizens of the world to contribute towards climate change. Thank you so much. Namaste. How are you all feeling right now? Good. Okay, that's what we need. At the same time, I feel both good and afraid. I'm afraid that what I'm about to share would be too huge for us to tackle. I won the USA Hackathon by sharing my experience in Malaysia working with the indigenous people in the Borneo rainforest, where I created a sports app that allows us to experience how it's like to have a new culture where it is not about chopping down the rainforest and pricing them. It is about valuing the pricelessness of life and nature. And I ask all of us here to imagine, it might be scary that to imagine a world where money is not the main driver of an economic system. And I ask all of us here, who here is brave enough to step into that world? That world where economy is actually planetary climate conscious. If you are, I would like to invite you to join us with my team who I've been working with too in the Stanford-based Zero Degree Project to innovate every Friday on how we can create a climate conscious economic system together. Thank you, I'm Vienna. <laughs> Can I have the mic? Hello. Hi, everyone. Just um, to say thank you to our awesome winners of the Reboot the Earth Hackathon Challenge. Please give them all a warm round of applause. They are such a great example that young people are not only uh, complaining and demanding for action and uh, asking for action, but they are, taking action, they are taking action themselves as leaders. So thank you very much for also being role models to other young people who are here, but who are also beyond. I'm here on behalf of the partners of the Reboot the Earth, my office, Office for the Information and Technology in the United Nations, SAP and Deloitte, to make a special announcement. It is that the winners of the Reboot the Earth Hackathon will receive mentorship and seed money to implement their solutions within their countries and their communities. And we will work with other partners to keep this momentum going throughout the year. And even more exciting news is that we will make this a program that also works on other sustainable development goals as well. So this will be a program that targets um, sustainable development goals one, two, three, four, five, six, all 17, and getting young people to share their technological innovative ideas and supporting them with networking, mentorship, and tools so that they can implement their ideas successfully in the, pla well, in the places that they come from. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you also to our partners, and we really look forward to continuing this Let's all reboot the earth. Thank you, thank you. Jayathma, did I hear you right? Did you say they're all receiving seed funding? Can we have a huge round of applause for that? This is climate action happening right in front of you. And it's
what's happening at the United Nations, please spread the word. Tweet about it if you haven't already. Um, our next session is one I'm, I was so excited to see on the agenda because often when we talk about climate, it's all polar bears and ice caps, and obviously those are serious. But for us to get regular people engaged in the climate crisis conversation, people who aren't in the rooms that we are in all the time, we actually have to connect it to their everyday lives. They need to understand that this is about the weather that makes their lives harder to live every day and the air that they're breathing. And in reality, what we need is to help them understand how to rally behind the climate movement in the ways that they rally behind, I don't know, their sports teams. So, <laughs> so who better to help us understand how to leverage the power of sports to protect our planet than people who are literally at the top of their game. And they're actually seeing the impact of climate change on the environment every day in their sports and in their lives. Please help me welcome our panel of Olympians and elite athletes. Joan Benoit Samuelson, Chloe Kim, Pita Taufa Tofua, Ibtihaj Mohammed, Eric Colston, and Hannah Mills. So I'm just, where am I least in the way here? Is this better? Right? That's better. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to see them because they're incredible. Um, so I'm just going to go down the line and ask you guys some questions because we are so excited to hear from you. Joan, why don't we start with you? You're one of the most decorated female runners in history, including a gold medal in the inaugural Women's Olympic Marathon in Los Angeles. But I hear you've also described yourself as an environmental barometer for climate change. What does that mean? And how are you seeing climate change impact sports? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you. We'll get this. Technology, sorry. Um, thank you. And thank you especially for giving sport and youth a voice I really believe the youth of today are our most valuable resource, so we need to support them in every way that we possibly can. I am about, about to embark on my sixth decade of marathoning, and during that time I've logged over 150,000 miles, so essentially I've run around the planet six times. And I can tell you the circumference is not shrinking, but the climate is changing. And we need to act now, and we need to act quickly. I see tangible evidence of climate change in my hometown of Freeport, Maine, where I've logged most of my miles. And our home borders on the Gulf of Maine, which is one of the fastest warming bodies of water anywhere in the world. And I've seen the changes in species, especially invasive species, in acidification, in erosion, in rising sea levels, and in warming waters. And this is an all-out emergency. I also feel the effects of a more intense UV uh, ray from, from the sun or increased rays from the sun, and it's become an occupational hazard for me in that I've had several basal cells removed. So it's not only the rising and warming seas, it's the intensity and the UV rays coming from the sun. I also believe that um, more and more people are looking to improve their health by getting out and exercising. And if we want to have a healthy body, we need to have a healthy environment, and the two are inextricably linked. So I do feel that I am that barometer for climate change. I took a lot of grief in 1984 for not moving out of Maine to train in a more polluted environment. Well, let me tell you, the Gulf of Maine and the state of Maine is a catch basin for everything that comes up the East Coast. So we need to act collectively, we need to act now, and we need to support our youth and their voices need to be heard. Thank you very much. You got to clap for that. Joan, that's so powerful. Thank you. Chloe. You were the youngest female snowboarder to win Olympic gold during the 2018 Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang when you were just 17. And you've talked about seeing the impact of climate change firsthand and feeling like you need to get involved, just like a lot of young people and a lot of us today. Do you think athletes have a unique perspective and voice around climate change? Yes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to start by saying how proud I am of everyone here. I am so inspired by my generation for fighting for change and acting on an issue that has been swept under the rug for too many years. Don't you think it's been like pretty? Definitely. Come on now, let's go, that. let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I started snowboarding when I was four years old and I loved it so much. I've been on some incredible adventures. Um, it's brought, it's created an, an unbreakable bond with my family, and it has taught me so many incredible lessons. But 
I'm so terrified that one day when I have a family, my kids are going to be like, Mom, what's snow? Is that like when the dinosaurs were around? So we have to keep fighting to save our planet. Some people won't listen, but we need to make them listen before it's too late. To everyone here, I wanted to tell you guys that you have a voice and never lose hope. We will make this change and we will save our home. So thank you. Thank you, Chloe. I have not heard it put that way before. We do not want snow to go the way of the dinosaurs at all. Also for you, especially. No. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. PETA, you're a Tongan athlete and UNICEF Pacific ambassador. And I understand your goal is to be the first athlete to compete in three different sports in the Olympics. You competed in Taekwondo in the Rio 2016 games, cross-country skiing at the Pyeongchang 2018 games, and now you're working to qualify in sprint kayaking for 2020. I'm tired, <laughs> which I hear was motivated by climate change. Is that true? And how are you using sports as a platform to draw attention to the issues we face? Uh, so it certainly is true. I mean, kayaking was a sport that I chose because it, uh, you know, it represents, I represent the Pacific. So we're at the front line of climate change. So when people say goals for this many years ahead, I'm like, we're seeing it now. Um, so w what, happens, what happens in a kayak is that if you lose balance, it's a very hard thing to stay balanced on. You, you fall in, and, and that's kind of what's happening with, uh, with our planet today is that somewhere along the line, we've lost balance. We've, we've got more carbon going into the air than is uh, sequestered into the ground. And, uh, you know, so we're paddling for the planet to bring awareness to what's happening. When I was at the, at the Winter Olympics, I got two phone calls. One was from my father telling me that, telling me that my, uh, my auntie had passed away. And she was one of the, the strongest women who taught me, uh, she taught me love for people and love. You're good. Come on. You're good. Come on. <laughs> and she taught me love for planet. The second call I got was that a cyclone had hit Tonga while I was at the Winter Olympics. 50% of all of our buildings destroyed, wiped out. I'm here in New York. If I, if I came here and I, and I said 50% of New York disappeared in one night, what would happen? People would act. 50% of my country was wiped out in one night. People haven't acted yet. I represent UNICEF in the Pacific. After the Olympics, I went back and I saw, I saw all, all of the tents that were made to house the kids. So the kids are still in tents learning. Uh, they're getting their education from there. So I... I call out to the leaders of the world. It's not tomorrow. It's not our children's children. It's us. It's now. It's happening. And it's going to affect all of us in some way or another. So, Malo Afatu, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Kida. I love that art is everywhere because kayaking is a metaphor for life, right? And there's so many metaphors in all of this. But I also think it's so important to underscore that we are having this conversation in New York City. And so often we're having these conversations in these big urban areas that are cosmopolitan uh, locales. But it's not just about us, right? This is a global conversation. And that's why it's so important for you to carry it out of this room back to where you're from and onto the internet and every single place that you can have conversations because it actually, it makes a difference. Um, and it lets people in all sorts of places realize that, that we are thinking about them even if we're having the conversation in this building. Ibtihaj, as an athlete and advocate, you've been a true trailblazer. You made history during the 2016 Rio Games as the first American woman to wear a hijab while competing in the Olympics. And you won a bronze medal. Obviously, that took tremendous determination and will. Is there anything we can learn from that athlete's mentality as we fight climate change? I forgot. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Pete, I'm so sorry to hear about your loss. Um, very moving words. I know that a lot of us feel motivated and encouraged when something hits close to home, when we have a traumatic experience. And I know that um, something similar happened to me and my family with the death of my sister. And I felt so motivated to, to be an agent of change. And what could I do? What could I, how could I give back in my sister's name? And my family and I, um, through Charity Water, launched a water project to build water wells in my sister's name uh, in Uganda to bring clean drinking water there. And when you ask the question about uh, athletes' mentality, what that means, 
um, I know how difficult it was to qualify for a U.S. Olympic team, what it meant to change the face of sport, but also how to encourage and motivate people to do the same um, in their own lives. And I think that with an athlete mindset of determination, of persistence, and relent relentlessness, uh, we can collectively tackle this climate emergency, and we can raise awareness and help move the world uh, to take climate action. Um, it's not an issue, it's not the only issue that I care about. Um, advocacy work, which I've always been motivated to use my platform for, but I'm here because I care about our world. I care about climate change. I know that it affects each of us in detrimental ways. Um, and for us as athletes, it affects the future of sport. And the bottom line is if there's no planet, there is no sport. I um, have had to overcome tremendous barriers to get where I am in sport, but I'm determined to use my platform to be an agent of change. I'm here because I care, and I want to do what I can to advance this work. And I hope that other professional athletes are motivated and feel compelled to join us. I believe in you guys. I believe in us. And it's our collective power that can change the world. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Abtahaj. Now, Eric, you're considered one of the most iconic revolutionary skateboarders in the world. A 12-time X Games participant in a counterculture sport that's about to make its Olympic debut in 2020. How does that skate culture mindset, that willingness to push boundaries, apply to this climate conversation? Um, well, I guess, uh, we, cause we come, I guess from some, uh, somewhat of a, a progressive community. Um, and within our community, you know, we, we kind of live by this unwritten code, but that we kind of respect our environment. So we have a place that we can actually do the thing we love, right? We just, we, 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 we have to take care of those places so we can be able to continue to do like those things. It's in the DNA of your sport. It is. And, and as our sport has grown and seeing what's happened also to this planet over the, 30 plus years of me skateboarding, I've actually traveled the world and you've seen the adverse effects of what, what is going on with what, how we're damaging this planet. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm nervous. This is crazy. You're doing um, great. Uh, uh, You're doing great. <laughs> um, but, uh, like I said, us as a community and the rest of youth, as, as, as we grow and we b become more and more educated and see what, what we can do to even the simple things, it doesn't, you know, we can, we're, it's, it's, it's obviously a big, big task. We're not going to be able to do it overnight. But little by little, as that becomes ingrained in us, like, like th that mindset of a skateboarder, we, those things just become natural and automatic. So we can do have. Do we need to be more rebellious in the way we think about this? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think we do. I mean, skaters are definitely, you know, we are a bit on a rebellious side and, and tiny bit. Yeah. <laughs> and we and, and and resilient, but we and we need to take that mindset in order to to what we're all here talking about and 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 trying to save this this yeah. world. Get hyped. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> you did awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Last but not least, Hannah, you're a British competitive sailor. You won silver at the 2012 London Olympics, gold at the 2016 Rio Games, but now you've started to speak out about plastics pollution and what we as individuals can and should do to change our habits. What pushed you to take action and how has your sport created a platform for you to call for action? Uh, hi everyone, thank you very much for having me. Um, the first point you kind of said about what pushed me to take action. My playground is the ocean. I've grown up sailing on the ocean since I was seven years old. Um, my first sort of connection with plastics in the ocean was through sailing and it getting stuck on the bottom of my boat and having to lift up what's called the centerboard and for it to float off and we'd carry on racing, but it would have stopped us dead in our tracks. And over the last sort of um, six to seven years um, in training up to the Rio 2016 Olympic Games, I just saw it getting worse and worse and worse, and every time we went out sailing, we'd pick up bits of plastic. Um, every beach we went to would just be covered in plastic, no matter where we were in the world. And it was just 
heartbreaking. It was really heartbreaking to see. Um, you know, our oceans hold huge amounts of CO2. They produce 50% of the oxygen we breathe. And I just felt like I had to act and I had to try and do something to help. Um, I've been inspired by sport my whole life. Sport creates moments. I think everyone here can relate to a, a sporting moment that inspired them to want to get up and do something. And, and, and I feel like we can harness this power of sport. And I wanted to try and unite the sporting community um, to come together, athletes, fans, um, spectators, volunteers, everyone to unite on on my personal goal, which is eradicating single-use plastic in sport. And so I've launched something called the Big Plastic Pledge, um, which the first phase is about us as individuals taking action, finding solutions, being proactive, um, which I think is probably the first and hardest step, is, is to take that stand and being brave. And I guess... Um, for everyone here to go to the website and sign up would be amazing. Bigplasticpledge.com. Uh, Say it again, Hannah. <laughs> Bigplasticpledge.com. Um, but get behind the athletes, get behind the sporting community because we, we care. We're here because we care. And I know there's thousands of other athletes who care. Um, and what I would say to everyone is, is to be brave, to take a stand, um, to keep pushing, uh, keep charging forward, and, and just take that first step towards creating the world we want to live in. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And before we let them go, I just have to say, you heard these, these folks' bios, right? Climate activist is not the obvious or first thing on their bios because Olympians and you know, winners of all sorts of things, starts, <laughs> it starts there. But what is amazing is that they are approaching climate as human beings, as people who are invested in the earth and in, in each other and in the planet. And the way that they are going about their climate activism is by being authentic and telling great, real, honest stories and being here with you um, when it is not the first thing on their agenda. And I just think we have to give them a huge round of applause to thank them for that. And how awesome were they as speakers. Thank you, thank you. Um, and with that, we are going into our next session, for which we need a lectern, you might have realized. Um, we're going to hear new commitments by and for youth and we are actually going to have a wonderful host with whom you're familiar, Mark Edo. Where are you? Ah, oh, there he is. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadira. Hi. How are you guys? You okay? Yeah, you okay? <laughs> Woo! Come on. <laughs> yeah. It's great. I bet you've made lots of new friends and met new, new people. Right? This is really cool. I saw a lot of great conversations. I'm a great ear wigger, so I was like listening in on a lot of conversations. It's great. Um, okay, so I, th I think um, this is the session that I believe sums up why we're here. Uh, it's a session where we hear firm and fresh commitments on climate action from young people from all over the world. Uh, and the world really needs you. It needs those young people to play a big part as possible in steering us away from the brink. Now, let's face it, the level of... Um, of, of commitment we've seen from the big decision makers, many of them that come here all the time, it's a big deal because they're here every year, has, has not, not been uh, nearly enough to reach the uh, scale of the challenges that we're seeing that the planet faces. We need drastic action. You could even call the climate crisis a crisis of leadership. And that crisis of leadership is, leaves a huge gulf, gulf and that uh, has to be bridged really by very much by the youth. So it's, it's an important thing that we're here, and it's important to find innovative solutions, uh, build international networks and do those things. Not just say what you want, but actually hear about some of the great things that people are doing. So over the next 45 minutes, I still have 45 minutes, right? Yeah, okay. We're gonna hear about 15 young leaders, and they're doing some great stuff. They're mobilizing youth for climate action. They're doing fantastic initiatives. They're doing toolkits. They're doing events. Uh, things that you can actually take away and steal. Please do, because that's the whole idea. These are to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Uh, we're also going to hear from public and private sector advocates for a sustainable future. Uh, they'll give us concrete, actionable ideas, not nice words. Uh, uh, these are ideas that will catalyze uh, climate action and can lay, help lay out a clear vision uh, for what needs to be achieved to reduce our emissions and uh, build more resilience in our societies. We'll also hear a, a call from the, from the youth 
uh, to world leaders. This is the chance to do that because we're in the center of world leadership uh, to call on them to produce ambitious, tangible, realistic and practical plans to meet the Paris goals. And their message to world leaders uh, will be clear. Follow our lead and come up with a more ambitious plan before December 2020. Now, before I begin, I want to say uh, hello and welcome to a special guest we have over here. I'm going to come to her later. We have with us, so where are you? Maybe I can ask you to stand there. Uh, this is the actress, Miss Una Chaplin. Una's been in Game of Thrones and all the Avatar movies, and she loves you guys, and she's here to support you, and you'll hear her later. Una Chaplin. Um, and I'll be chatting with her later in, in, in the session. We'll sort of break it up with a little chat. And so, okay, so here's how the commitments will work. Uh, it's going to be really, really snappy. Uh, each of the participants of groups, there's about 14 or 15 of them, uh, will have two minutes each for the announcement. We don't have a lot of time because it's a, there's a lot to pack into the day. Uh, and they've got specifically, uh, they're going to have to specifically focus on the projects that they're announcing. So don't go, go off kilter. You have to be really specific. So for speed, uh, we've devised a set format. So you say hi or hello, my name is X from country X, and we are, and then you say what you're helping to solve, like uh, uh, climate change mitigation, uh, for example. Uh, and then you say how, by X, Y, Z. So you tell us how you're doing it. So that's the format. They know the format. They've practiced it. Uh, and then they have an opportunity at the end uh, to call on global leaders if they want to. It's an opportunity. They don't have to, uh, to engage youth in decision making, for example, by calling on global leaders to, to do more. So this is their chance. Okay. So first up, um, they're going to come to the, the, you've got them already there. I see a lot of people. That's good. That's, uh, that's uh, reassuring. Uh, so the first up is the Global Alliance for Youth Climate Councils. We have 14 young people uh, from various countries in the alliance, but uh, I believe Nina Moga Benson is going to present for two minutes. Nina? You're first on the microphone, right? Not easy to be first. Oh, great. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? I'll try to speak up. All right. As of today, four in ten people around the globe are below the age of 25. That's almost half the population of the entire world. And this half will come to bear the consequences of a crisis that we've had almost no influence on stopping. The Youth Climate Rebellion reveals a paradox. Youth, we speak up in our local communities, we change our diets, we change our habits, we take to the streets, we dedicate our education and our careers to building concrete solutions to climate action. Yet, we're not included in the formal decision-making process. Now, we suggest, we suggest that we change that. Countries such as my own in Denmark have taken some steps to bridge the gap between youth and policymakers. They've created, for example, an independent council of young people with direct access to our Minister of Climate, a youth climate council. And we're not alone. Our other countries have already started similar things. It works as non-paid, non independent bodies with an open mandate to propose any green policy in any sector and report directly to political decision makers. It's time now that more countries, states and local government to do the same. On stage, you see the part of a global alliance of climate activists, activists from 15 different countries. Namibia, Chile, Moldova, Poland, Nepal, Brazil, Nigeria, Ghana, Morocco, Algeria, Marshall Islands, Haiti, and India. And we are growing. We are pushing for the formal inclusion of young, of young people in climate policy making to translate the demand of the street into concrete accountable policy proposal. We are not simply saying to the older generation to you must act. We are saying include us in the action. Let us take part of the responsibility 
engage young people in the political process that will come to define the society that we are growing into. Here we have a model of, of Youth Climate Council. Come, please, and work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to ask, to ask you to exit stage right or that left, okay? Thank you very much. Fantastic. Wonderful. Next on, I said it was snappy, so I'm going to go straight to the next. Uh, next is, uh, is knowledge is power, and we need to put things down and, and, and disseminate. So this is a paper on the role of youth uh, in uh, adaptation uh, action. It's presented by the Youth Constituency at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Long, uh, that's a long name, so they shortened it to a cool name, Yongo. And the participants are Patrick Verkuhen from Global Commission on Ad Ad Adaptation, and from Yongo, Joshua Amamponsem, Maria Uma and Chigozi Ude. Two minutes, please, guys. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Auma from Uganda, and I'm here with Joshua Amponsen from Ghana. And we are part of the Yango constituency, which is the ofi official youth constituency to the UNFCCC. And today we are here to launch the Youth and Climate Adaptation Report that has been commissioned by the Global Commission on Adaptation. And this report was basically done through a series of, of on-ground consultations with young people all over the world, including Ghana, Kenya, Australia, India, the SIDS, and Canada as well. Through this report, we are calling for a change in institutional structures, and I then commend the work of the Youth uh, Climate Council because we can't solve this problem with old institutional structures. We want a new mechanism and a framework that allows for youth action on adaptation to feed into the national adaptation plans and into the NDCs. On the same vein, we are calling for increasing climate education for young people. We want this, we were calling on national countries and government to include climate change education in the national curriculum. This is something that has not been done for, for so, so many countries, and we're calling for that to happen. We are also calling for finance for young people in adaptation. Usually, we hear the words of uh, leaders saying that you are the highest population, and you have so much power, but no one is giving us the money, and no one is killing our solutions. And through this report, we realized that a lot of young people have solutions at the community level, but it doesn't even get to the national level. And when it gets there, all they get is media attention and it ends over there. We don't want this kind of attention. What we want is investment into our solutions and go beyond that. We will conclude. We will conclude to say that we want all young people to challenge the status quo. Don't be shaken, don't be broken. And last Greta said yesterday, if they don't change, we're going to change them. Thank you. Adapt for our future. Thank you very much. Um, the next project is a campaign led by high school uh, youth. It's meant to radically recalibrate people's thinking on how climate change is connected to all other issues on Earth. It's called Scaling Up, Getting to the Roots, and it's presented by Jamie Margolin. Jamie, you've got two. Two minutes. Three of you. Go ahead. Two minutes, three of you. Hello, and we are a delegation from the youth climate justice organization called Zero Hour. Albert Einstein defined insanity as trying to solve an issue with the same thinking that caused it. And right now, a lot of leaders and a lot of businesses are trying to solve the climate crisis with the same systems of oppression that caused it in the first place. Specifically, colonialism, racism, unregulated capitalism, and the patriarchy. If you want to get rid of a weed, you do not snip it by the stem because then it's going to grow back. You have to pull it up by the roots. And we have to do the exact same thing with the climate crisis. But a lot of times, our leaders and businesses and just the general population is often not aware of these root systemic issues. And so what's the answer to that? Education. So what Zero Hour has created is a national education campaign known as Getting to the Roots of, the, of Climate Change. And what this is, is this is a presentation that Zero Hour ambassadors are trained with. They then take this presentation, they go into their school communities, and they teach it to their peers. So it's peer-on-peer -peer education. And this presentation dives deep into how the systems of repression that Jamie mentioned 
are the causes of the climate crisis, how they impact, um, how they are part of the intersections of the impacts of the climate crisis as well. And the presentation also goes into the solutions that don't perpetuate these systems. And at the moment, we have approximately over 600 ambassadors, but we want to take over the world. And after one successful year of giving these presentations, we will expand our campaign by 2,000 new youth ambassadors who will be giving these presentations to uh, anywhere from 50 to 100,000 young people from across the country and world. And with this information, young people will be able to really take action in their communities uh, towards a truly uh, just transition um, to solve this climate crisis. By the end. By the end of 2020, we plan to have, like Madeline said, 2,000 people trained and about 550 to 100,000 people hearing the presentation. So if you guys would like to be a part of bringing about this revolutionary change and getting to the roots of the climate crisis, follow Zero Hour at This Is Zero Hour on social media and sign up to become an ambassador because we need everyone to get involved. For leaders out there who are wondering what they can do, what we the youth are asking for you to do is to stop treating the climate crisis like it's in this silo away from all other issues. You cannot attack health care. You cannot talk about war. You cannot talk about all these other issues outside of the lens of the climate crisis. The climate crisis is intersectional to all of these issues, and it is impossible to solve hunger, to solve any of these other issues without getting to the roots. So that, it was, that is what we ask, because this is zero hour to solve the climate crisis. And the only way we're going to solve it in time is getting to the roots. Thank you very, very much for that. Getting to the roots, scaling up, getting to the roots. Um, next is uh, Geo6 for Youth. And now the idea is to create a translation mechanism so that complex scientific messages, research, research and so on on climate can reach the youth so they can make better decisions and take more decisive actions uh, to, uh, to lead to sustainable change. The idea comes from Priti Patel. Preeti. Preeti, yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Preeti Patel. I'm from the US, and I'm an author for the geo for youth report. Globally, youth number 1.6 billion strong and growing. We, the youth, have the potential, the fearlessness, and the determination to transform our current problems into opportunities by creating innovative and sustainable solutions. geo for youth is a derivative product of the sixth edition of the Global Environment Outlook, which is the United Nations Environment's flagship report, which assesses the state of the global environment. The report is a one-stop shop guide created for and by the youth, forged by a team of 28 authors from 19 countries over the past 16 months. Geo for Youth emphasizes that we must fundamentally alter our food, energy, and waste systems to ensure that we have a healthy planet for generations to come. A global shift is needed towards a circular economy where we extract and waste fewer resources by extending the shelf life of materials and keeping resources in use for as long as possible. The report provides concrete examples of what youth can do in their daily lives and how they can shape their own future through greener career choices, demanding accountability, employing innovative technology, and shaping policy. We've created this interactive report to include videos, animated graphics, interviews, and case studies. There are small-scale community-led projects, daily sustainable actions, and individual guides to green jobs. The challenges presented in this report provide us with the opportunity to map out our actions to ensure that we will have a healthy planet with healthy people for future generations. Our future depends on the decisions and actions that youth will commit to and continue to undertake from today onward. To, additionally, a geo for youth survey was conducted over the course of four months, which allowed close to 2,000 young people globally to share their ideas and thoughts about our climate. We're excited to announce that we'll be launching the geo for youth report in November. You will be able to download the ebook online, and I encourage everyone to take a look at this unique youth-driven report. geo for youth has illustrated that youth have technology and social media, geographical and social diversity, and creativity and innovation on their side. But it is up to all of us to do this. Ensuring a healthy planet depends on this generation, and this could be a critical defining moment in our history. So let's be the first generation to leave this planet in better shape than what we were born into. 
The time is now, and youth are critical for this movement. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Prithi. It's almost as if you, you set me up for the next presentation because it's called Earth Uprising, and it's presented by Alexandria Villaseno. Please, Alexandria. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexandria V. Senor, and I first want to acknowledge the Earth Uprising delegates who aren't with us today because their visas were delayed or denied. They're from Nigeria, Uganda, Brazil, China, and Russia. This is unacceptable, and in the future, we will fiercely advocate for their attendance. Now, here is Kira Lonergan with our first announcement. Hello, everyone. My name is Kira Lonergan. As the United States Ambassador for Earth Uprising, I work with our grassroots, local youth community organizers. During 2020, I'll be working with our youth, youth ambassadors from all over the world as they build their local youth groups. Today, we're announcing our hashtag MyUprising campaign. For this campaign, we're providing a suite of tools and resources to support youth taking climate action in their communities. We will help youth take action in five different ways. One, local government lobbying. Two, community presentations, educating others on the climate crisis. Three, advocating for climate education in our school administrations and school boards. Four, unique direct actions and protest. And five, participating in Fridays for Future and the global climate strikes. For my uprising, youth community leaders will choose how they want to take action on the climate crisis and create their lo own local uprisings. Earth, uprisings. Earth Uprising will elevate the My Uprising actions and stories of youth around the world. For our second announcement, here is Shin Soen. Hi, everyone. My name is Shiv Soen, and I apologize for the hoarseness in my voice. I lost it during the global climate strike yesterday. <laughs> 300,000 people came to New York City. <clears throat> So I apologize, 300,000. Um, so I am a student at New York University and today I'm so excited to announce Earth Uprising College. Um, this is our initiative to develop college-based Earth Uprising student groups around the world. Earth Uprising College has three main focuses. Um, first, we're gonna advocate for increased um, climate education at the college level. We'll be campaigning for new majors and minors and climate integration into current programs and courses. Next, we'll, um, next we'll initiate new divestment initiatives around the world and amplify those initiatives already underway. Um, we won't stand by any longer while fossil fuel funds influence our education system through higher education. <clears throat> Um, finally, we will be providing a path for college students um, to be more involved in humanitarian work through the United Nations. The current response to climate fuel disasters is absolutely inadequate. Even though our generation did not create this angry, out of, um, out of our control earth system, we are the generation that is going to be cleaning up this mess. Um, we will be bringing the youth to, nego to the negotiation table, uplifting and defending those impacted the most by the climate crisis. Thank you. Hi, my name is Wendy Gao, and this Friday, September 27th, Earth Uprising is launching its completely redesigned and interactive website at earthuprising.org. Here you can find information about our hashtag MyUprising and Earth Uprising College campaigns. We're so excited to have you join us. Hi, my name is Ritvik Janam Sethi, and thank you for having us today. The Earth is Uprising. Join us. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We've got to stick to two minutes, though, because we're behind. So I'll quickly go on to the next. Uh, the UN Civil Society Forum saw, uh, saw hundreds of young people sign up for the Youth Climate Compact. Juan Pablo Celis is going to make an announcement about that. Two minutes, Juan. There is no time for stagnation. There's no time for excuses. Without an immediate paradigm shift, we will continue to see profoundly destructive consequences on human life across the planet. Over 3,000 young people around the globe came together at the 68th United Nations Civil Society Conference to pledge for climate action through the Youth Climate Compact. 
recognizing that everyone can take climate action to fit their unique realities. We have created 25 pledges that resonate with us and our communities. We have committed to use renewable sources of energy, to invest in climate solutions and green jobs, to commit to friendly consumption practices, to actively advocate for climate progressive policies, to educate ourselves, to educate our families, to condemn laws that obstruct climate justice to vulnerable groups, to foster inclusion and collaboration among all generations and stakeholders. We must transform apathy into action. Commit, pledge, act. Fantastic. Juan Pablo Celis, thank you. Now, I said you had a special guest. She's, uh, let me tell you a little bit about her. She's Charlie Chaplin's granddaughter. She's uh, on Game of Thrones. I think she plays Rob Stark's wife, a very powerful woman, Talisa Maiga. And uh, in Avatar, she's in all the films. She's the lead uh, character in the next four films. And she's here to support you. So give her a round of applause, please. Una Chaplin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Una. Look at this. It's historic. It's been great. Listen, if the, if the leaders out there have not heard the voice now, they're definitely going to hear it after today. Right. They definitely are. And uh, we'll just keep talking until they do, because this is not acceptable, what we're doing up until now. And this is just the most inspiring thing I've ever seen in my life. So thank you so much to all the young people here standing up for what is right, what is true, what is beautiful, for what is natural and uh, what is logical as well. So thank you. Yeah. I've got to ask a question. We're, we humans are supposed to be the most intellectual and intelligent beasts of, on the earth, but we're destroying the only home we have. It's, it seems like our big brains are not connected to big hearts. So do, we need to change things in that regard, don't we? I, you know, it's interesting because you asked me this just now, and I am thinking that we are also the only animal or the only creature that is aware of our own death, and I think that makes us very, very afraid. And so we surround ourselves with all of these dead things that are supposed to protect us from death at all costs, protects us from the elements, from predators, from all of these things. And I think that separates us from what is natural, from the death that is natural. Even when we till the earth, we don't cover it back with the dead leaves and the dead matter and all of this dead stuff that is good for the earth as it transforms and, 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 and regenerates and, and, and becomes new life. And I think that is something that is like, okay, so if we're, if we're going to pay attention to the cycles of life, then we can also pay attention to the cycles of death and just re-familiarize ourselves with that. I don't know how that relates to the climate right, crisis, it. it's but absolutely right. you know, I think there is something about the cycles that is relevant today. Today is the equinox, everybody. That it is the autumn equinox. And there's something really, really beautiful about paying attention to the cycles of nature. Today is the day where the day and the night are of equal length. It's a day of balance. We're also going into Libra season. That's, you know, um, great because I got lots of Libra friends. But um, yeah, just paying attention to those cycles of nature, I think, is very, very important as we move through these conversations. Una Chaplin. So the next segment, we're moving into a different segment now, is uh, focused on announcement directly related to youth. And we kick off, we have a presentation on something we haven't heard yet. It's financing. Two minutes on financing. Come ahead. Hello, everybody. My name is Ibrahim al Husseini. I'm the managing partner of Full Cycle Climate Fund. We designed Full Cycle to accelerate the deployment of climate restoring technologies. And I say that because it's now business's responsibility not just to do less harm, we're past that point, we now actually have to do deliberate, targeted, and prioritize good because we're out of time. And I want to remind you all that this is where capital needs to flow, that this is where the jobs of the future are. You know, as you've all heard, the number one uh, fastest growing job in America is solar installer and the second is windmill uh, operator. What is it? Windmill technician. technician. So it's a very exciting time for all of our careers to be directed towards the green future. And that's a very exciting thing to announce. And this is my partner, Stefan Nicolo. Good afternoon. Uh, there's some real energy in this room. Uh, yesterday, four and a half million people, I'm assuming many folks in this room, demanded change for climate. 
Um, you folks are the future. You youth, we need your voice to make our pledge as private enterprise something that comes to life. We need you to vote where you can vote freely and demand your politicians enact policies that do the right thing by you and your future. We need you to be the future activists to get even louder than you are. And we need you to support private enterprises that are doing the right thing and, and enabling you to be the consumers that are mindful about the choices you make. So thank you for all the things that you've committed. Um, and it's a pleasure for us to be here to make this commitment and lead and spearhead private enterprises' commitment to challenging the status quo and addressing the climate crisis. So thank you. Thank you very much. A hundred million dollars of capital into climate restoring technologies by 2020. Uh, now, the next presentation will provide a brief description of, a found, of foundations for climate action and online learning experience. You've got two minutes. Hello, my name is Patricia Rosada. It's a true honor to be here today and talk before you, true leaders, especially human rights fighters, as Mrs. Bachelet here and Jajarma. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Just remember that having a healthy earth and healthy lungs are human rights, too. I'm here on behalf of Nova Academy. We are launching this program on partnership, in a partnership with the uh, Jadwell's office, thank you so much for your hard work. Um, you're going to find videos, you're going to find information, you're going to discuss, you're going to learn, you're going to fight with each other for good, to keep working together. Today is the start of a work together as a common world. It doesn't matter if you speak Spanish, as I do. It doesn't matter if you speak English or any other language. We are here today to work together. So I hope you all join our program. It's going to be online really soon up. So remember, get into our website, nova.com. We're really happy to have you joining. Just to finalize, as Jajadma said, you're agents of change. And don't forget that. There are a lot of people who are not here today. They didn't have the opportunity to join. They couldn't join. So you have responsibility to work for them too. And as my alma mater says, this is your moment. So take action. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, I, I mentioned that we're also going to hear commitments from governments to the Minister of State for Youth Affairs uh, is here to make a quick one minute announcement on behalf of the government of UAE. Now, back in July, UAE hosted the opening of the Abu Dhabi climate meeting and its youth dialogue. And that set a precedent of sorts for youth involvement in the preparation process of this youth uh, climate summit. And I do want to mention, actually, an interesting fact. She was the youngest minister in the world when she was appointed. And plus, she, her main task is to mainstream the voice of youth in government decision making. Please welcome Her Excellency Shama El Mazrui. Madam, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Centralizing youth and industry players who empower them must be the new standard, not just at this climate change, but all the subsequent conversations on climate action. I'm proud to say that the United Arab Emirates proves it can be done. And thanks to leadership with the will, and decision makers with a mandate. Our Ministry of Climate Change and Environment has been an absolute trendsetter in involving youth in every phase of its leadership and execution on climate action policy and initiatives. Youth helped draft the United Arab Emirates 2050 climate change plan. Youth are drafting the UAE's National Determined Contributions, NDCs, for our part in the, in the Paris Agreement. And youth have created our own youth climate strategy, driving youth integration in all meetings on the challenges of climate change. And for ongoing youth engagement, the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment has an official youth council which represents the voice of youth and also serve as routine advisors directly to the minister. The UE has adopted a range of national level policies on climate change, green growth, artificial intelligence aimed at moving away from the dependence on hydrocarbons to a diversified economy and to, towards sustainable development. But we want to do something more and we pledge to address every one of those challenges with young people co-leading or contributing at the helm. The UAE wants to pledge to organize more consistent national dialogues between government, youth, and civil society on climate action and climate priorities, and to mobilize all key local and federal players in the climate field to establish internal youth advisory councils and include youth in both the design and the implementation of climate-related projects in the United Arab Emirates. 
Three, we want to encourage youth to submit policy proposals and solutions on climate matters. Four, we want to train and educate young people consistently on climate change and sustainability through our new program through the Emirates Youth Professional School that His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid just launched. We also want to provide internships to youth with key players and pioneers in climate change. Beyond that, we're willing to offer our tools of youth engagement on climate action at large, and we want to learn from yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, next is a two, two minutes on a, a one-stop shop idea uh, from the Youth Entrepreneurship for South, or the YES Fellowship. It's uh, led by the UN Office of South-South Cooperation and OSGE. Uh, two minutes, please. I'm Jorge Chiriek, the director of the UN Office for South-South Cooperation. And South-South Cooperation is the civil societies, the governments, the actors of the developing world getting together to confront common challenges. And we have a lot of answers and we have a lot of challenges. So our office put together with a lot of partners, including the office of the EMO of Youth, an initiative called Youth for South, which is a multi-pronged effort to generate and train and support leadership in the South committed to the global agenda. And today we're announcing the launch of YES, the Entre Entrepreneurs for the Global South. And to make it a concrete proposal, today we're announcing the first initiative together with several partners, including the Shenzhen Youth Federation, to train 10,000 entrepreneurs of the South over the next five years. The resources are available, have been committed, the partnerships have been established, among others, with the African Union Commission, the, again, the Office of the Envoy, and many other partners. And we already have the, the first series of trainings and resources aligned to make this initiative a reality. How does this contrib contribute to the fight against climate change? Number one, climate change cannot be separated from inequality. And to confront inequality, we need to create jobs, we need to create opportunities for young people. And at the same time, we are confronting now unsustainable patterns of production and consumption. So the participants of this program will receive training in such a way that their entrepreneurship is consistent with the sustainability of our planet. We're very proud that Shenzhen the Silicon Valley of China, a city that 40 years ago was one of the a small fishing village, is a big partner, and I would like the chairman of the Youth Federation, Mr. Cheng Daixing, to complete our presentation. Dear youth friends, good afternoon. It's really a real pleasure and honor for me to be here to represent the Youth Federation of Shenzhen. Shenzhen is an important window of China reform. It's a city of innovation, youth, and volunteers. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the city. The average age is only 33 years old. In 2018, the GDP was 2.44 trillion RMB yuan. Shenzhen has made a lot of progress technologically. We have also been advocating green lifestyle and uh, low carbon development. We're also a important city for the first group of uh, sustainable development program. We're also providing Chinese experience for the SDG goals of the UN. Our federation is a youth federation. We have 1.65 million volunteers, and uh, we have also a lot of uh, young entrepreneurs. We believe that we need entrepreneurship. We need the participation of the young entrepreneurs. In four decades, Shenzhen evolved from a small fishing village to a big city. In this process, young people have played an important role to deal with climate change. The young people in Shenzhen want to join hands with uh, the young people from the rest of the world. As I ask you to uh, step off the stage, as an African, I'm a Nigerian, and an African, I worry a lot about climate change and the effects it's already ha having on my continent, one of the world's most impoverished regions. Uh, Africa's contribution to greenhouse gases is, is minimal in comparison to the East and the West, but it seems the least protected are always the most affected. 
Um, but Africa is home to a fantastically vibrant young population. If it's supported, it can be a massive part of this solution. That's why it's great to introduce the concept of the African Youth Climate Hub. It's an initiative to amplify the voices of Africa's youth. Two minutes. I am Manal. I'm 16 years old and I'm from Agadir in Morocco. My country is committed for climate change, but I'm here today because I'm worried. Three years ago, I organized my first strike for climate. And as we all know, during those three years, adults have not done enough to rise the climate change challenge. But I'm here also because I'm optimist. Every step we took yesterday marching was a step that took us closer to a better planet for all of us, including us as Africans. Now let me tell you what we are here for. We are here as African youth. I am here with Yusina, Miriam, Tariq, and Asu. We are Africans, and we are working for a better planet for all of us. It is not a dream. It is a pledge we make. It is a pledge we invite you to make with us. I am Yari Dabera. I'm 25 years old. I'm from Ethiopia, a country where committed to plant 4 billion trees. I'm here as an African youth. I'm here because I believe in co-creating co impactful knowledge and relevant projects for climate action in Africa across generation. I'm here with Serena, Hatim, Aminatu, and Maria. Together with Mohammed Six Foundation for Environmental Protection, Yongo, OCP Group, and University of University Mohammed Six, Mohammed Six Polytechnic uh, Bengurur, we are working hard. We are working hard to respond to and to amplify African youth voice and action. It's a pledge we are making, and that's. A, and that's a pledge we invite you all to make with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, the second government to make a commitment is Italy, Italia. We have with us the Italian Minister for the Environment, Mr. Sergio Costa, who will take just a couple of minutes to tell you about an exciting event next year in the lead up to COP26. Minister will be speaking in Italian. So grab, for those of you that uh, non parlo italiano, please put uh, your uh, headsets on. Signore. You, we need to, so I'm going to ask you to walk. Un applauso, and we have an applause. Thank you. I am very pleased to be here before an audience of so many young people that I feel invested with a great responsibility. You, more than anyone else, hold in your hearts the attention to the planet and sustainability. Climate change is without a doubt one of the greatest challenges we are called to face today in the next decades. Recent data and scientific reports have further confirmed what we already know. It is a real threat for current and future generations, and we have little time left to adopt the policies needed to avert its worst effects, especially on the most vulnerable. This notion was clearly expressed by many great personalities of every creed and belief. Today, it is our duty, as Pope Francis stated, to integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. A great German philosopher, Georg Friedrich Hegel, had this to say about human nature, nothing in the world has ever been accomplished without passion. Indeed, I feel that I belong to that progressive world that captured your passion, your cry, your will to be part of the change that is needed to guarantee the world a sustainable future. This is why 
we have turned from words to deeds. Italy has made a significant contribution to the making of today's summit. As you may know, Italy and the United Kingdom have reached an agreement to share the presidency of the COP26 in 2020. In this framework, Italy will host, during the pre-COP preparatory events, an important global event for youths on climate change. We want to give young people the opportunity to make concrete proposals on some of the most important issues on the climate agenda, including the increase in global ambition, the spread of environmental education, and the implementation of intergenerational equity, a principle that Italy vigorously supported in negotiations until it was actually inserted in the Paris Agreement. This outcome was made possible also thanks to the hard work carried out by you, and that is why I want to thank you for this. On the trail of the important events taking place here in New York, the Youth Summit in Italy will offer an unprecedented opportunity for young people to participate in decision-making processes in an authentic and structured manner. We will concretely support your participation in the event to ensure its inclusiveness, recognizing the vital contribution of so many young men and women to raising the awareness of the global public. And I say to you, with all the passion in my heart, please come and participate. Please come to the youth COP26 in 2020 next fall because it'll be a time to dare and we can dare together. Thank you. Sergio Costa, grazie. Finalmente, finally, the last one that we have. Um, in a few, probably uh, in a few months' time, you might be receiving in your inbox is a huge survey, one of the biggest surveys ever done on world youth and their attitudes to climate and ideas. That it's called State of Youth, and it is the final, the final commitment and presentation. So, give a warm round of applause, please. to shape the future, to be remembered as the generation that made the difference. Nearly half the world population is under 24 years old. Billions who will have to deal tomorrow with the consequences of decisions made today. Let's go! And even though some of us can vote, are we really being represented? Welcome to the State of Youth, a platform to unite young people from all over the world. Today, we invite you to join us to share knowledge and goals, to define where we stand on the issues that matter to us, to make our voices heard, and take action. For youth, by youth. We're mobile, we're borderless. We are one and we are all. We are the state of youth, and so are you. My name is Abraham M. Keita. I come from Liberia, where rising sea levels affect hundreds of thousands of people every day. Yesterday, the State of Youth was formally launched at the World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates. Nearly half of the world's population is under the age of 24, but young voices are rarely represented when world leaders make important decisions about our future. That changes today, here and now. My name is Kehakusha from Canada, and together we form the Board of the State of Youth, a global board. The State of Youth, connected by Facebook, is launching one minute from now 
its first ever worldwide specialized voting system, a preferendum, only for youth and not just on one issue that concerns us. With millions together, we unite and we demand that our voices be heard. Our first preferendum, which launches within just one minute, will ask you to vote on your preferred actions against climate change. Take your phone out now and let your voices be heard. Go to stateofyouth.org, register as a citizen, and vote. The intermediate results of the upcoming two days will be communicated to world leaders this Monday at the UN General Assembly. The state of youth is something that you want to be part of to get your voices noticed by leaders of this planet. Are you ready? I now formally declare that the State of Youth First Preferendum has opened. And to everyone who is in this hall, especially the young people, not the old people who are in this hall, you have lived your life. Uh, uh, we do not care about you, we care about our lives. So the young people who are in this hall, I want you to go out there, tell the adults that it is about time they stop listening to their smart brains and start listening to their compassionate heart. Thank you. Wow. That was the final powerful commitment by and for young people. Uh, it has been an honor to be the moderator. That concludes the commitment session. Thank you very much. A huge round of applause, not just for the last, but the first, the middle, all of the great commitments you heard. Nadira. Thank you to Mark Edo. Are you mesmerized by action? You are. <laughs> we are going to nail this last transition. So I would love it if the entire panel for the intergenerational town hall would join us up here. This next session is what this entire Youth Climate Summit is about. It is intergenerational dialogue. And you're going to see it happening right in front of you. And you're going to be part of it. So get ready. Are you having fun? You looked mesmerized by action, let me tell you. Come on through, panelists. I also love how packed it got in here. How often do you see the afternoon session of something like this be more full than the morning? It's musical chairs. If we could take our seats. I'm so excited to introduce the co-chairs of our intergenerational town hall. I'm not sure if you can guess who they are. <laughs> but it is my sincere pleasure to welcome the United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed and UNICEF Youth Advocate Temochi Naulusala, the co-chairs of today's intergenerational town hall. And Deputy Secretary General, would you be so kind as to kick us off? Do you have a speech too? You have a He'll speech. go straight after. Okay. That's great. I was just wondering if we both had speeches because usually it's the UN with speeches and, and young people who just say it as it is. So afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome. I'm really honored to be with everyone in the room today. It was an exciting morning that you had with the SG, so I'm really happy that I'm able uh, to join you today at the first ever UN um, Youth Summit. Hundreds of uh, young leaders have traveled across the world to be here, and we've seen you this morning. You're still here this afternoon. But let me reiterate the message of the SG this morning. It is really incredibly special to have you all here with us and um, to have you doing the speaking, and most of the time we doing the listening. Never before in history has the UN offered such a prominent and a visible platform for young people at a political summit. Beyond today's Youth Summit, the Climate Action Summit has featured young people every step of the way, and so you are at the vanguard of the efforts that have been made. 
It is a testament to the fact that your generation is leading on climate action and drawing worldwide attention to the climate emergency in a way that is impossible to imagine just a little over a year ago. We're pleased to welcome Excellencies Dr. Hilda Hein, the President of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Pres our um, very own Mary Robinson, um, President, uh, former President of uh, Ireland and Chair of the Elders, and of course, uh, Mrs. Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, all really special people who have been long in the vanguard of fighting for rights and climate action. So thank you all for joining the Intergenerational Town Hall meeting. To all young leaders in the room, this is your opportunity to ask direct, unfiltered questions to these world leaders. Um, as the Secretary General has often said, what you say in the corridor when we're not there, please say it now. <laughs> Don't be afraid to be blunt and challenge us. We're ready to stand to listen to you and to engage with you. This is an opportunity we've never had before, and we already know you're helping us move the needle. So, defining issues of our time, let's work to make it happen. Thank you. And Chimochi. Excellencies, distinguished guests, young children, young people, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. My name is Timothy, my friends call me Jim. I'm here because climate change has had a major impact on my life and on the lives of the children and families in my country, Fiji. I remember Cyclone Winston when it struck our nation two years ago. Our family stayed together in our home, listening as the winds howled and the rains poured. I have never heard anything like that. It was the loudest thing I have ever heard. I was afraid. After this storm passed away, it was very bad for my community and for us kids. I saw houses blown away, farms were destroyed, and crops were washed away. I know people who lost their family. My school was badly damaged, and it, and it still has not been repaired. Books and school supplies were gone. Today, things are still not right. We are not back to where we were. For those of us who live in island nations, we are already seeing and feeling and living the consequences of a warming planet. But I am not alone. Please raise your hand if you or someone you know has been affected by climate change. Climate change affects us all. We need everyone to understand that we must work as a team before it's too late. Speak up. This is our time. Now, I would like to introduce Madam Zinclay Azamua. Madam, the floor is yours. And I must say a word or two about Zinclay before she comes out because the host you'll have for this session is incredible. She's the host of Know This, a daily evening news show on Facebook Watch, and a correspondent at Now This News. And as you'll see firsthand, she's wonderful. Zinclay? Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. Well, thank you so much, UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, UNICEF Young Advocate, uh, excellencies, government officials, young activists, global citizens, thank you all for joining us here. As said, my name is Zinclay Esamwa, and I am the moderator of tonight's town hall. Um, I'm also the host and correspondent at Now This News. At Now This, every single day, we document the stories of young people pushing and pressing for change. And today, we've gotten to witness that firsthand, right? We've heard from people using 3D printing with recycling. We just heard from Olympians who reminded us of why the climate crisis is so big and so pressing. And so right now, we're going to have a town hall where you can ask these world leaders directly any questions you have. I encourage you to be bold and creative with your questions, of course, while also being concise and respectful. Uh, we do have a lot of ground rules to go through, but before we do that, I want to make sure I introduce all of our panelists as well. Um, some are here on the floor and some are in the first row as well. The reason for that, because we're all together in this, a community. So first, can we just give everyone a round of applause before I say some names? So we have the following. Uh, if you don't mind, 
either standing or recognizing the audience with a hand raise as I state your names. Her Excellency, President of the Marshall Islands, Hilda Heine, Chair of Elders and former President of Ireland, Mary Robinson. Her Excellency, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and former President of Chile, Michelle Bachelet. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Alexander van der Bellen, Federal President of the Republic of Austria. President of the Interparliamentary Union and member of Mexico's Parliament, Gabriela Cuevas Perón. And Governor of Washington State in the United States, J. Robert Inslee. Let's give everyone a round of applause. Of course, it's worth mentioning we're also joined by high-level representatives, ministers, and different heads of UN agencies, so thank you all for being with us as well. So let's go through the ground rules. How's everyone doing, first of all? I know this is like the last session. Are you with me? Yes? Okay. So for the ground rules, we're going to do a little call and response. So when I say number one, I just want you to say it back to me. Number Number one. Okay, one more time. Number one. Great. First rule, we are here to talk, to ask, and to learn from one another. Shortly, I will open the floor for you all to ask questions. Given that there are over 600 of us in this space, not everyone will get to ask. We do ask that um, those who speak limit themselves to one question. Number two. You forgot already. Number two. We want to make sure each of our panelists has the opportunity to answer. Therefore, we're going to have an hour, excuse me, a 50-minute period for questions. The first 30 minutes will be general questions. That means we ask that you do not direct it to a specific panelist or speaker, but ask a question that anyone can answer. The last 20 minutes can be directed questions, and we'd like every speaker to speak. Number three. During the final 20 minutes, as I said, you're welcome to direct your question to a specific panelist or world leader. Number four, if you have a question, we ask that you raise your hand if able. This is how this will work. Uh, Once I select you, you will have the opportunity to answer. Please keep your answers to no longer than one minute. If you go over that, your mic will be cut off. If you're wondering, how do I turn on my mic? Uh, On your... At your desk, you'll see a silver button. You can press that. If I've selected you, your mic will turn red and you are welcome to speak. For our panelists, you are limited to two minutes because we have so much to get through. I don't want to have to cut off your mic, so I appreciate you sticking to time. Number five. Number five. Thank you. Please keep your questions to just that. Please limit monologues or lengthy statements and focus on what you would like to ask. Number six, when you ask a question, we do ask that you state your name and where you are from. Um, I'm going to be a roaming moderator. I do not have a headset, a headset to translate. So if you ask a question that needs to be translated, panelists, I will just ask that you answer um, immediately. I will be unable to translate that for you. You do have headsets at your table. And lastly, number seven. Please remain respectful and do not speak when someone is asking a question or speaking. But most importantly, we want this to be fun, right? It's not every day that we get everyone here in this space. So, are we ready? Great. So, to start, we have a question from the Youth Voices Working Group. It's a global working group that helped shape the summit. Can the assigned representative from that group please stand? Thank you so much. You can stay standing so they know to turn your mic on and feel free to ask your question. You can sit and speak into the mic now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Katarzyna Smentek from Katowice, Poland, and um, I would like to express my gratitude on behalf of Youth Working Group um, for organizing this Youth Summit, the greatest gathering of youth on climate change in the UN headquarters. So thank you for that on our behalf. As it was mentioned during opening ceremony, uh, there are more than 1,000 young people here from more than 140 member states of the UN, which means that majority of the states is present here. We are very happy that we could talk to the world leaders, we could ask them questions and discuss our ideas, but we are afraid that after coming back home, this momentum will be lost. Our voices will just stay here and we won't be heard back in our countries. That's why I would like to ask 
on behalf of the Youth Working Group, our great panel, what pra practical actions we, the world's youth present here today, can take in order to ensure the uh, consistency and energy that brought us here today. You know that there are various mechanisms present in the world, but what can we do to make sure that they are introduced and in place and we can keep the momentum present here? We have to be heard at what can we do to make sure it's ensured and it's actually that our voices are part of decision-making processes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, feel free to clap for that. And any panelist is welcome to answer. The question being, what is an action that young people can take? Governor Inslee. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Jan Zim, Governor of the State of Washington. It's a state in the northwest corner of the United States. First off, I appreciate being asked that question. I'm 68 years of age, and I've been declared the, the oldest kid climate striker in America this year. And I appreciate that honor, and I appreciate the nature of your question, because it is pivotal. We know this is an extraordinary meeting. I feel an honor to be here. I started this uh, in 1972, when I was your age, at the very first United Nations Conference on the Environment in Stockholm, Sweden. And here I find myself being asked a question at age 68, when I sat where you were 47 years ago. And the number one message that I would leave with you is, you are so powerful that the power you have in your generation is unquestionable. And the reason is, is that no 22-year-old uh, can look at any 68-year-old and say, you do not have the right, sir or madam, to destroy my future in the eye and expect anything but an answer, yes, sir, or yes, madam. This is a moral authority that is unquestionable. It is the most powerful moral authority in the globe today, and I encourage you to use that on a daily basis. Now, I will speak very tactically, if I may. I'm a politician. I'm a governor of a state. We're doing great things on, on uh, climate change. And let me suggest the thing that I encourage you to think about is a very personal relationship with your elected officials. The climate strike movement, the marches, our UN meeting here today is powerful. But the most powerful thing you can do is have a cup of coffee and look at a, an elected official in the eye and ask them to act on your behalf. That is a power that is, that is absolutely unquestionable. The second thing I want to share with you is that we have had a paucity of action from Washington, D.C., from our capital in America recently. And I know that has frustrated the world. But I want you to know that we are with you. I lead a group called the United States Climate Alliance. It's a group of 25 states. And we have 25 states that represent 60% of the U.S. economy today who are dedicated to the Paris Agreement and moving even faster than that. And I want you to know that when you go talk to your elected official, when you get home, you can tell them that, that over half of the United States is already with you, so don't use the absence of action from the White House from an excuse for inaction. And I am telling you that in January 2021, the United States of America will begin fully embraced with you to defeat climate change. Good luck. Thank you. Um, I represent the elders here, and could I just begin, since I'm an old-timer in the UN, by saying what a wonderful thing it is to come into the Trusteeship Council and see it rejuvenated. Wow, it is fantastic. It's just wonderful to see the young people here. Um, you've already made your voices heard. You've already, I think, changed the debate because of your direct impacts, your anger, your pain, everything that you've been saying over the last few days. Um, I would like to see every country have a Climate Youth Council. I know a number of countries do. I'd like to see every country have one. That would help. Thank you. Great. Our next question. Thank you. Hello? I'm here. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yeah. Uh, I am. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm Pan from China. Uh, in my point of view, that uh, the climate change problem cannot be solved only by one slogan, one program, and a one group of people. Although we have so many people here, young people, but compared with the young population of the world, we just a little bit of the young people. So uh, this kind of problem cannot be solved by, by us, but I think that the problem should be solved, uh, should be understood by the whole world, and it needs the action of every sing single person. So what we should concern is how to build up people's mind, every people's per personal mind, and their daily behaviors in their daily life, such as the uh, shared bicycles or digital recept, or, uh, or some other kind of pro um, public products. So my question is, uh, as for the world leaders, uh, what do you think of the future trend of the environmental public products and how do you expect young people to do in this area? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Would anyone like to speak to it? And to restate it a bit, what are initiatives or actions, as I understood, what are initiatives that, what are public products or initiatives that can be created to further um, addressing climate change and the climate crisis? Perhaps you can speak to initiatives that exist within your own countries. Yes, please. Well, I, I will speak as human rights uh, the commissioner, but also as former president of Chile, because as human rights commissioner, what I'm doing now is advocating everywhere to show that the biggest threat for humanity and for the planet is climate change, but also is the biggest threat for human rights all over the world, because it will affect dramatically uh, the people's conditions of life. And you have heard today, you know about it, and we have heard even personal experience that this is not about the future, it's happening in many countries now. And that means why small islands are the ones who are leading the way, because they are living today the consequence of climate change. What can be done? And then I will part, uh, and I, it's fantastic on anything we do that you are participating because if this is a global challenge that needs all of us there, all of us and youth is essential because it's not only about the future generation, it is about the future generation, but it's also about today. And I have to say that I believe, and I always say that youth is not only an issue of age because you have young people who are not aware, who are not committed, who are not passionate about it. That's why I always invented the term accumulated youth, because I thought that I will die young, because young means to be committed with something, to care about people. But in concrete, what measures can be done? Being the president of the republic, being aware of climate change and, and its consequences. I did lots of things, from uh, taxes for, for uh, for um, contaminated products and cars and so on. We created um, marine protected areas where we passed from the 5% of the economic, exclusive, uh, economic zone to 54 in four years of my government. We created national parks in the size of Switzerland. So there was a, we banned uh, uh, plastic bags. We, um, we did... Um, a very strong uh, national action plan with, uh, on prevention, mitigation, adaptation. We did uh, programs of education at schools only on four years. So what I mean to say, and Chile is not a rich country. So many people said we cannot tackle climate change because you need to be a rich country. That's not true. It's true that we need more funding for a lot of initiatives, but it's true that it needs essentially political will, courage, and make tough decisions, but it can be done. If in Chile we did it, the rest of the world, of the world can do. And you are essential to remain to tell all leaders that they can do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the next question. Um, um, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Manal Bidar. I'm a young activist. I like to call myself a climate fighter. I have uh, came here along from Morocco to represent my country and to represent Africa. Personally, I see that trust is the key to all of our problems. I see that if we trust ourselves, ourselves as youth, we can make a big change. If you governments and you adults trust us as youth, then we can make decisions. We are the future. 
We are not here to play or to say, uh, to say something, uh, to say, we are here to make decisions. We are here to be heard. So my question is how to enhance and establish that trust between governments, adults, and youth. And thank you so much. It has been an honor to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you. So that question is how to further trust between the government and youth. President of the Marshall Islands. Thank you. And that was a very good question. And may I congratulate all the youth uh, who are here today by uh, giving them a round of applause for participating in today's uh, session. I think we can begin to uh, build trust between youth and uh, leaders by, uh, by having uh, events like this, you know, where we're having intergenerational discussions so that we can see eye to eye what's going on and how our leaders uh, are, um, you know, their thoughts and uh, whether or not uh, they're uh, making commitments. I'm from a small island country and uh, we speak of trust. Um, my island is only two meters above sea level, and we're told that in 30 years we'll be submerged. Now, if I didn't have trust in other uh, leaders of the, country, of, of the world, I would give up. I would just, uh, you know, stop advocating because we're told that we are, uh, our, uh, our cause is lost. But I have to trust that there is humanity among leaders of the world and that they would do their part to ensure that countries that are impacted by climate change will not uh, be wiped off the face of the earth. So I'm talking about at all countries. We are in that uh, category. And if we didn't have trust uh, with uh, the rest of the world, we wouldn't be here. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Just, just to add to what the President of the Marshall Islands was saying, uh, I think this has been a very important two days, the March yesterday and the Youth Summit today, calling out the adults in the world. Trust is based on earning that trust. You earn that trust by doing what you should be doing. And we know that this has not been happening. Governments are not stepping up enough. And we are not seeing the kind of response yet that we need to see. Trust has to be earned not wished for or hoped for, earned. And when it's earned, then everything changes and we move forward. And so that's the importance of the climate justice movement that I'm so happy to see. Having talked about it for a long time, I used to talk about climate justice referring to small island states, least developed countries, indigenous peoples, poor communities in poor countries, in, in rich countries, and people would say, yes, but that's not quite me. You know, it would pass them by. Children, by talking about the intergenerational injustice, have mainstreamed climate justice, have made it so much um, an issue for every family in the world now. Um, you saw the marches yesterday from all over the world. Every family in the world has to think about this issue. Every government in the world has to now build that trust by taking the action that young people are calling for. That's what we need. Thank you. We'll hear from the UN High Commissioner and then the next. Well, I think that one of the important things of this summit is that you have been able to get together from different parts of the world. You have been producing networkings, but also you have heard and, and developed a lot of concrete proposals. So it's not about only young people complaining about leaders not taking the actions they need to take, but it's also young people showing that you can have good solutions to our common problems. So that means that you, you earn that trust that Mary was talking because you show not only that you care, but that you are able to, give part, to be part of the solution. But I would say something else. This cannot be a momentum that goes like a big wave and then disappears. You need to use all the networkings, all the uh, platforms, all the things we have heard here today to continue moving, to continue relating, to continue producing this momentum that continues year after year. And, that, and also I would say there, there to go into other steps, there to try to be elected 
on decision making, local decision making, provincial decision making positions. Because we need also not only young people from the outside of the institution telling the institution what they have to do, we need young people represented in the places where decisions are made. So please, there, you can be fantastic representative also in those places where leaders will make decisions and you are the leaders. Thank you. And next we'll hear from IPU President Gabriela Cuevas Peron. Thank you. The only way to rebuild trust is with results. And that is what we are not seeing in politicians. The Interparliamentary Union is the global organization of national parliaments. We have 179 countries as members. Yes, we do have a huge responsibility. We need to develop better legislation. We need to allocate budget in a better way, to design uh, tax incentives, uh, to oversight, and to have uh, constant exchanges with the governments. But I believe that there are two very important things that we need to change right now. And one is related to our duty with representation. We need more representative institutions. There are some very good examples. We already heard about Denmark, but also, for example, Cyprus is uh, designing a parallel parliament. Some other parliaments are having specialized committees or councils for climate change and for youth. There are a lot of, a lot of examples, very good ones. But allow me to tell you what I have learned personally. The first time that I got elected as a member of parliament, I was 21 years old. Now I am the youngest president of the Interparliamentary Union. Well, actually the only considered young parliamentarian as president of this organization in 130 years. You can do, translate your passion, all what you're doing in your activism into policy, into legislation. You can go further and to change politics. Please do not expect that the same people are going to change everything. We need fresh ideas. We need your inspiration. We need your passion. So welcome to politics. Thank you very much. So our next question is in French. And if you do not speak French, I encourage you to put your headset on. Panelists, I do not have a headset, so please jump in once you've heard the question. And then I'm going to make a little hike up to the balcony so you all can get some love too. So please feel free to ask your question. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mohamed Ali Sabun from Chad. Young people have spoken out. The United Nations has spoken out for decades as well. We have heard declarations and resolutions. Some have gone without being followed up upon. Young people around the world are aware of the situation. Now, I come from a country called Chad with Lake Chad, which in the past held a very important position, but it is in the process of disappearing. And a great deal of engagement by the Chadian government and a great deal of declarations and statements from the United Nations, uh, Lake Chad is nevertheless disappearing. And so in your view, what would be the solution for Lake Chad to recover its position? Because for me, it is unacceptable for the people of Chad to see the United Nations speak about Lake Chad every day in international reports, in resolutions, representatives and diplomats say all these things, but nevertheless, Lake Chad is disappearing today. So please, in your view, what would be the solutions with young people, with us that are here to solve that? Thank you. Just want to make sure, did you all understand that or do you need a repeat? Please. I'm not an expert on Lake Chad, but I know from my friend Hindu, Omari Ibrahim, from so many of my friends about the, the utter concern about the way that Lake Chad has been disappearing and you know the climate impacts, the Boko Haram, the, all of those issues. Um, there is a project to resuscitate Lake Chad. I think it needs the innovation of youth. I think actually what needs to happen is that project needs to be somehow circulated to the platforms that we've been hearing about all day 
of the solutions of young people to see, because it's all about, um, uh, you know, a resuscitation. It's a, it's a, a, a way of um, rescuing a place that's, a lake that's disappearing. Um, I was in Greenland recently, and I was watching the melting and the, the thunder of um, uh, glaciers calving far too quickly now because of the melt. And I felt, I've never felt closer to nature. I've never felt more, um, more of an identity with what indigenous peoples keep telling us. We are not living um, sustainably with the nature, with the ecosystems that sustain us. And Lake Chad is just a tragic example of that. I think young people can help us, but there is a project that is being worked on at the moment, which um, Amina can tell us more about perhaps. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's just, it's not enough. Um, it, it, we need more. Thank maybe, you. Maybe just to say that for the Lake Chad, um, the governments around there have put a project up. It's about recharging Lake Chad from another river. Um, it's difficult. Uh, that's a huge amount of resources that are required. And that seems to be perhaps one of the biggest challenges we have, is that we know what to do. We have the solutions. Um, to get them done at the scale that need to be done and with the urgency requires resources. And this is where your voice will be strong with ministers of finance in every country, uh, with the financial systems, with the, the money that is available there for it to find its way behind um, huge uh, investments like this, but would have a, a difference in the lives of many. In Chad, it would, it, not just Chad, the whole sub-region, about 40 million people would um, benefit from the recharging of that, that will bring back livelihoods. Um, on a personal level, that's where I went to school, but on the other side of Chad in Nigeria. In, in the Northeast, where today you hear about how Boko Haram was born, it, it did not exist. The terrorists are not born, but it was born out of injustice. It was born out of the drying up of the Lake Chad and livelihoods no longer being there. It was born out of a, a taking away of the dignity of people because they didn't have a job anymore, a hopelessness, um, and that in itself um, is a perfect storm for instability. So today, it's a worthy investment to find those resources, to have your voices, remembering that in 10, 15 years' time, you will be at the helm of affairs. You will be in these positions taking decisions. Um, and so it's important that we try to lay that foundation now. And thank you for the young man from Chad who put, that, um, put Lake Chad back on the map. It's been crying for resuscitation. Thank you very much. For context, we have about 10 minutes left in the, direct, uh, in the general question portion, and then we will pivot to directed questions. As I said, there's about 600 of us and not much time. I do encourage you, if you find a lot of people around you have questions, maybe um, see if you have similar questions and you can tag team. We're going to take a question from the balcony that has already been selected. Thank you so much for uh, this uh, wonderful opportunity, uh, Your Excellencies. I'm Tala Aganui, uh, the Founder and Executive Director of the Africa Science Diplomacy and Policy Network. Uh, I would like to ask this question, cognizant of the fact that consumerism is at the core of the present global climate crisis, uh, at this particular moment, what are they, are we actively uh, engage uh, when we are active. What con con cognizant of the fact that consumerism is at the uh, core of the global climate crisis at the present moment, uh, at the time when we are actively engaged in fighting poverty uh, and uh, we are expecting people to live healthy and better lives, uh, how do we find a balance between fighting uh, poverty and uh, engaging actively in uh, reversing uh, the climate crisis? Thank, Thank you, you for that much. question. How do we combat poverty and the climate crisis? Is it possible to do both at the same time? President of Austria. Uh, there is yeah. uh, uh, a discussion in many industrialized countries right now um, how to how to reform the tax system uh, in in the face of uh, the climate crisis? 
uh, how to put a price on, on uh, CO2, for instance, uh, without, without uh, alarming uh, uh, the, poor, the, the poorer part of the population, uh, for instance, uh, people living outside of the big towns. Um, basically, I think it's fairly easy in, 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 that, in that case. Um, uh, you, could, you could invent a, a tax system that taxes uh, gas, uh, gasoline and, and other, um, um, essentially the, the things that uh, emit um, greenhouse gases and uh, uh, giving back uh, the, the tax receipts uh, to people ne needing it. Um, you know, not just increasing the, the tax load for the people, but giving it back to those who need it, especially those who have to travel uh, to get to work. Um, I'm, I'm an economist. I used to be an economist before I became a politician, and I was always surprised how difficult it is to get the message across, um, um, <clears throat> even in, also in, in my country, in, in Austria. Um, I'm not sure that I would advise you to, to get uh, into, into, into very detailed uh, discussions with politicians right now. Um, if you know something about, very good. Uh, if, uh, but for me, the most the most important thing of the last, say, uh, 12 months was you get attention. You get public attention. Uh, you can't, you know, uh, people can't, uh, politicians can't ignore you. And we in Austria, for instance, we have uh, the Austrian World Summit we had uh, the third time this year. It was re originally uh, an idea of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Everybody knows Arnie, of course. Um, and uh, we had uh, Greta Thunberg uh, in, in, in Vienna in May. Uh, what I want to say by that is um, try to get coalition partners that the, the, that the media um, will listen to. They have to. If Arnie says something, uh, not only in Austria, the media will listen. If Greta Thunberg says something in public, the media will report, listen and report. Uh, also, you have, you have instruments in hand that we 20 years ago did not have, and that is all the social media, Instagram and Facebook and who knows what else, you know, all these things. Uh, we didn't have that 20 years ago. It was very difficult to get the attention of the media. I remember very well uh, telling a journalist in Austria something about, for instance, tax reform and, and the climate and climate change, and he said, well, but we've already written about that. And it was true. A couple of months ago, they had written about it. But you don't, you know, you don't get uh, uh, the thing, the, the, the amount of attention that you will need. And finally, I think for the last, for the last 12 months, due to Greta and, and, and all the Fridays for Future movements and, and all the movements, finally, uh, we have this public attention that you need that the politicians feel the pressure. And my last, my last thing in, in this respect is uh, don't ignore elections. Go to the vote and vote. The young people are not the majority, not, at least not in industrialized countries. You are a minority. But your vote may be decisive. It may be decisive for the election result. And then we'll get finally results in measures against the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that uh, apparently some uh, voices uh, are talking against solidarity. But we are here because we believe in solidarity. We believe that precisely climate change is a, a very good example on solidarity between all generations. We want to take care of the planet because we believe that the next generations deserve a better planet. But also, when we talk about the economy, it has to be about solidarity. We are having in 
some regions the consumption that is uh, provoking hunger in other, in other regions. We need an economy based on solidarity because jobs are not going to be the same in 10 years. We need an economy also based in solidarity, in equality, in generosity, because we do not want to leave anyone behind. If we really want to give a better world to the next generations, we all need to take our own responsibility. And when we talk about consumption, it is our, our own daily decisions. It is not only about politicians or if you're engaged at the UN or if you are a student. It is about the way that we want to build an, a, new, a new and a better planet. Thank you. So we have about five more minutes. We're taking two questions, one from here that's been selected and one from the balcony, and then we will transition to our directed questions. Hello. No, okay, thanks. Um, hey y'all, my name is Sueta Cecilar, I'm living in NYC. Um, dear world leaders, I ask you, what, what's the purpose of having this summit if two days from now you are letting fossil fuel corporations and CEOs of corporations take the stage along with member nations and allowing them to influence pol climate policy when they are the ones that created this crisis? What do you say to my community in Tamil Nadu in India that just experienced an awful drought for months and to my fellow U.S. youth of color experiencing environmental racism by the hands of these corporations every day. You claim you want to listen to youth solutions, but this feels more like a photo op. As youth, we are asking you to kick out polluters and center frontline youth. Um, if everyone will please stand and sing along. One, two, three. Leaders, Leaders of the world, kick the oil men out, cause we've got, got no right to kill our future now. now. Heed the youth's call and the frontline voices, y'all. The emergency is now. Time to kick polluters out. Time to kick polluters out. Leaders of the world, kick the oil men out. Cause they've got no right to kill our future now. Thank you. Heed the youth's call and the frontline voices, y'all. The emergency is now time to kick polluters out. Time to kick polluters out. Thank you. Polluters out. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you clearly signed up for a panel with youth activists. So it looks like Governor Inslee wants to take this one. So thank you very much. that we need to kick out, frankly. And I want to answer this question that was asked a little earlier about the need for trust. We do need to build up a sense of trust. And the trust we need to build up, the most important aspect of that trust, is that any politician in any democracy, in any continent, at any level from city council to state legislator to president, we have to develop the recognition and the trust that if they don't act on climate and respond to the needs of this generation, they need to trust they're going to be thrown out of office. That's a simple thing, the trust we've got to develop. And the way to do that to start with is to cut off the fossil fuel industries and their ability to influence democracy. And I feel very strongly. And that means we've got to stop uh, taking uh, financing from the fossil fuel industry in our democratic elections. It means that we have to stop. They keep, the fossil fuel industry keeps trying to cut off my microphone here. <laughs> that means we have to stop using our public assets and giving it away to fossil fuel corporations. And it means we have to stop the enormous subsidization of the fossil fuel industries that allow them to pollute our one atmosphere in unlimited amounts without regulation. When we do this, we will have a chance and I'm glad we're going to send that message to every politician in the world today. You're going to be extinct, just like those dinosaurs up at the museum I just saw. You're going to be politically extinct because the people and the youth of the world are going to rise up and vote against every single politician who won't act. When we do that, we'll have a chance. That's the
thank you. Would love to hear some other leaders weigh in on how do countries reckon with um, corporations and fossil fuels? Anyone want to take a bite? Um, what what I've been saying um, as a former what, I, what I've been saying as a former president is that. Uh, corporations in the fossil fuel industry have been losing their social license to operate. And uh, that we, we need to cut, as has been said, fossil fuel subsidies. We need to make a very, much more rapid transi transition to clean energy. And I was at the second convening in the Vatican of oil and gas company heads and the uh, um, uh, uh, investors in fossil fuel. And it was clear to me they will not move unless disrupted, unless disrupted, somehow, by litigation, by shareholders, by investors. We need disruption in order to get where we need to be. Thank you. Please. I already, I already mentioned that we, we increased taxes to all those companies and, and products that contaminate more. We ended subsidies to fossil fuels, but also we increased incentives for all kinds of clean energy. And we increased energy from 4% in my country in four years to 20%, and it's increasing the matrix in the energetic matrix of clean energy friendly with environment. So it can be done. And it's really, it's really good. And you have to bring those companies on board in terms of giving incentives to do the right thing. And if not, ending with the disincentive that can make them continue doing what they're doing. Thank you. We'll now take one more general question from the balcony and we'll move on to our directed questions. Um, hello. Oh, sorry, I believe the question has been selected on the far left, my far left. Thank you. La ladies and gentlemen, my name is Piyashank Hamakarim, and I represent Jinga Dosti, uh, Group for Environmental Research and Climate Action in a 10 million population land called Kurdistan in the Middle East. I am here to tell leaders of nation and co cooperation that we, the youth generation, the regeneration, are here in growing global numbers as guardians of our mother nature and our father time and the infinite varieties of children which you have carelessly abandoned within this fragile global family. But meanwhile, let me share with you some inspiring enormous achievement that happens in my little uh, Kurdish corner of this universe. We became the, the strongest voice of the eco-friends in the Kurdistan and now in the region, everyone is speaking about climate change and environmental. In just only three months, when the um, new cabinet announced in the region, the prime minister solicited our environmental proposal and promised to implant it in, the, in, the, in his plan. We convinced a group of parliament members to work on renewing environmental legislation and renewable investment. And we even installed the first bicycle lines and, and start segregation of waste in the region which is very, it was very important in the region. But my question is that the UN and the developed countries in, of our global home must now embolden the younger civil nations, those developing countries who need more than just moral encouragement. Moral encouragement, everyone can give moral encouragement, but we need actual investment in renewable energy. As one of, of your younger civil nations, I came from a land of oil, but there is no renewable investment in my region. From, from the me generation to the we generation, the worldwide youth generation have become the regeneration. Sadly and dramatically perhaps the last generation that has the choice to be or not to be. That's really the question. So my question is that, uh, will UN and developed countries, will the people who, uh, who believe in climate change, who believe in this global threat, we, we, who believe in a threat that does not care about what language do you speak, what culture you came from, or from which generation you are. Are they able to help us? Are they able to, to send their companies, private companies, to make investment in the, developing, in, the develop, in the less developed countries of the world? Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. So the question I'm hearing from that is, 
with countries with leaders who believe that climate change is real, what are they doing? Are they doing enough? Or are climate deniers overwhelming that conversation? President of the Marshall Islands. Um, thank you. Um, in the case of the Marshall Islands, uh, we're uh, actively working towards renewable energy. Our issue is uh, financing. And I think this is one of the areas that uh, this discussion has to go towards because there are countries who believe in climate change and we're trying to do what we can to change, but we just simply do not have the resources. So it comes back to uh, developing countries and uh, resources that are out there uh, from um, uh, donor uh, partners. They need to come together and make those possible for countries that want to invest in renewable energy. We want to move forward but we lack the resources. So um, I, I guess I'm putting that out there because we are climate, climate change believer and we want action, but we're limited by lack of resources. Thank you. Please. Uh, let me just say against all odds, let's not forget that in 2015, all of you and governments, business came together to agree the Paris Agreement. And let's not just put that aside, because that is, in fact, what we ought to hold governments and businesses accountable to. That's why we have the summit on Monday, which is to try to achieve the first target. So your gathering today is putting pressure on the urgency for that to happen. Without this summit on Monday, there would have been a complete silence. There would have been no movement. But what we've seen since Katowice in Poland last year is that businesses, governments are all coming to announce not the rhetoric, not any more speeches, but bringing plans on Monday. Now that's not all governments. That's the beginning of the groundswell that you have started that we have to follow through all the way through this summit up to COP25 and COP26 where the 2020 target means we make it or we break it. That's when we have to bend the curve. So there's a huge amount of work we have to do here on in. And, and so to the, the last question, what's the UN doing about it? Every single one of its staff, its agencies, its funds, its programs are, are motivated, they're incentivized, they are um, committed to helping countries to implement their NDCs. The NDCs you ought to be querying, every single country, where are you on your NDCs? Look at the top 20 emitters and see who are those top 20 countries and what are we doing about targeting them reaching the, the net zero um, uh, neutral carbon target for 2050. There are so many things that we can hold specific people to account. What we can do at the UN is empower you, give you the tools, give you the space, convene, and make sure that your voices are amplified. Um, and, and the rest is really a collaboration. It's a collaboration of getting every, everyone out there to do the right thing and be on the right side of history. Thank you very much. We're now moving into our period of directed questions. I kindly remind the audience to please ask concise questions. We don't want to have to cut your microphone off. Our first directed question is to um, the president of the Interparliamentary Union and member of Mexico's parliament, Gabriela Cuevas Peron. Hello, my name is Edgar Mejia uh, from Mexico, and this is uh, for Mrs. Cuevas. Um, I'm one of the five summer solution winners. And as you said, it, um, it is difficult to make changes through policies. Welcome to it, uh, or to politics. Um, and we hope that we've created a momentum that will actually create a change. But I wanted to know, um, as the UN, or people in power that can amplify our voices, what are the steps or in initiatives that you're having to support social enterprise in a very competitive market where it's difficult to get access? Thank you. Uh, well, I have two hats to answer these questions. Uh, so yes, as a Mexican Congresswoman, we are developing, and I, I started also when I was in the Senate just before going to Congress now, we are developing a set of legislation that is going precisely into the direction that Madam Deputy Secretary General was saying. Yes, all countries, or almost all countries, agreed on the Paris Agreement. Now we need to go for implementation. That means how we are going to first ratify all these instruments. We did that in Mexico super fast. 
But then how are we going to translate all those international commitments into national and local realities? And that's why parliamentarians are so important. We already did that in Mexico with our climate change legislation. I believe that we have some challenges still when it comes to budget allocation, with oversight, with a, a, a closer relationship with the government, particularly into energy policies. But now what we are moving forward is how to create precisely this new environment for social enterprises. Uh, I believe that's a, a, not only a new trend, but it's a must. And about the Interparliamentary Union, well, we are, again, following also these processes in terms of how to raise awareness with all the parliaments in the planet. Second, we are trying to build a, a step-by-step -step guidance in terms of how to uh, translate the Paris Agreement into very concrete pieces of legislations that could be useful for all the countries. We have every year a meeting, a parliamentary event related to, to COP, and that is uh, becoming very, very much uh, uh, useful. Uh, and thanks also to UN because we're organizing that very closely. We are giving the parliamentarians, and maybe we, we should do something here like that, homework. It is not about traveling as parliamentarians and having a very interesting meeting as, as we're doing now. It's about how are you going to behave, how are you going to change your national reality. The only way to change the, plan the planet is changing our own communities. Thank you. We have a question on the balcony. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maitin Yukmon. I come from Myanmar. I'm an indigenous youth caucus representative here. For youths, as you all know, um, uh, let me first thank to this intergenerational town hall dialogue because as ind indigenous peoples, we always tr believe in intergenerational cooperation, intergenerational learning, and intergenerational transfer of the knowledges that we have. As youths, here today, 500 youths out of around 8,000 youths who applied for this summit were selected. And out of those youths, only 100 were funded by the UN. So where is our really commitment for the youths? And the second point is, we always talk about uh, youths uh, we always encourage youth to engage more, but it's always uh, financial uh, restrictions that youth always have. But then, to this event, five friends of ours, five indigenous youth representatives who were fully funded by the UN were denied, denied their visa. And they failed to attend this event. So here I have a question. In terms of commitment, in terms of financially and in terms of arrangement uh, to the states. Uh, my question uh, goes to the de uh, Madam Deputy Secretary General and also to, uh, to the member state uh, leaders. What kind of uh, necessary engagement or arrangements were made and what kind of discussions you had in, in order that this youth, uh, Climate Youth Summit is successful. And I would like to hear more about your commitments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. Always good to have an opportunity to clarify. Well, the 100 is certainly not enough, but it was better than nothing before. So I think it's really important for us to start those steps and demand more because that's what's needed. It's the same as the climate action we're looking for. There are climate actions that are happening around the world, but they're nowhere near good enough. One of the things that the SG has done in the UN is to say that both gender parity and youth in the right places in terms of employment, our engagement, and what we do, not just in New York, but in all our countries, should increase. And it has started. Um, what we did for this, I mean, we had, yes, 100 green tickets, but what we had done was to encourage every single member state to have youth in their delegations. 
That also has not happened as well as, as before. We have 193 delegations and we hope that they, we will see all of them carry youth in. Um, we can make those recommendations, but it is for member states to take them up. Our agencies, funds and programs have also sponsored youth that maybe we don't know about here. I mean, how many by UNICEF, by UNDP, by, uh, by a number of agencies we have had. Also, the Youth Envoys Office has done the same. Um, so again, we are far short of where we should be, um, but efforts have been made um, and you are here. And in terms of the visas, there were five that we didn't get, I think maybe about nine that we didn't get in the end. Uh, but quite frankly, there were over um, 100 across that weren't there before. Um, our efforts together with our country offices, um, with the Youth uh, Envoys Office, with our member states, uh, managed to reduce that. Not enough. There should be no one left behind. Every visa should have been had. Um, but that's what we continue to do. In the UN, there is a reality and there is an aspiration. And our job here is to sell the hope to close that gap. And that's exactly what we're trying to do day in, day out, day out. That's what we exist for, to close that gap between the reality and the aspiration. Thank you. It's really encouraging to see how many thoughtful questions you all have. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more. This question is in Spanish, so I encourage you to put your headsets on. Okay, hi everyone. <laughs> eh, bueno. Felipe Hernandez is my uh, name from Chile, and I'm putting this question to Madam Michelle Bachelet, um, former president of uh, Chile. Uh, in Latin America, there is a major problem, obviously, climate change and climate justice is also a problem. Certainly, if I think, look at my country, Chile, uh, human rights are constantly being violated in, uh, in Chile. There are, there are villages and cities where uh, people are dying from um, pollution. They've been, this has been happening for years now. And more than half of the environmental activists uh, assassinated every year are in Latin America, some of them by the state itself. So my question is, what role um, can you play as High Commissioner for Human Rights and former president of my country to uh, help these uh, underdeveloped so-called countries of Latin America uh, in this situation? How can you provide justice for these activists that have been killed in Chile and Colombia and elsewhere? Um, um, so that this can end. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should I answer in Spanish or in English? What do you think? Spanish. Okay, I'll do it in Spanish. So, eh, gracias por tu pregunta. Thank you for your question. Well, yes, the major concern that we have is because of the harassment of the human rights defenders in general, and then amongst those, those that are defending environmental rights, those that are defending the rights of the property of indigenous peoples, those that uh, defend the rights of women, those that defend the rights of the LGBT community, the defenders of various kinds of rights, and very often, states or companies uh, violate their rights. Uh, Berta Caceres, for example, was assassinated in uh, Honduras because she was fighting for her land, for water rights, to uh, stop certain projects. So it's a task both of my office of the High Commissioner for, Refu for Human Rights of the United uh, Nations as well as UNESCO, for example, to um, protect journalists. Uh, in particular, they can inform people of what's happening the violations that are existing of uh, human rights or situations of corruption or other kinds of situations. Uh, one of our priorities is to defend those that are defending uh, human rights. And to do that, we work with governments. First and foremost, we have monitoring, ongoing monitoring of uh, all environmental um, defenders, um, or human rights defenders, and very often they're the same people. 
And we, uh, when we find out uh, of a violation, we denounce it, we discuss it with the government to see what measures they're taking uh, in order to avoid these things happening. And we also um, work with governments when they do have protection mechanisms, but sometimes those mechanisms are not sufficient. Um, and uh, in the case of Mexico, for example, uh, we have representative with us here. We're working with them. They have protection mechanisms, but this Despite that, there have been deaths of journalists and human rights defenders, and my office in Mexico produced a, a report with over 100 recommendations that could be followed by the government in order to improve their system. So we, as an office, were raising our voice, and we've made public statements when there have been assassinations of indigenous leaders who are fighting for their indigenous lands, uh, but also for environmental issues in various parts of the country. And we continue to accompany their, them, their, their trials to make sure that there is justice and ensure that those that are responsible are brought to justice and that their families are given the due reparation and support that they need. That's our task as an office, and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. So if we all can just take a minute to give a round of applause to you all for your thoughtful questions and to all of our panelists and leaders for your insightful answers. Since this is a summit about youth, I don't want to put him on the spot, but Tomochi, would you mind answering our final question, which is just, do you have hope in the midst of this climate crisis? What are your thoughts? Um, I hope that uh, what we have discussed today, um, that uh, you go and uh, tell it or share it to your countries. And also, I hope that the world leaders uh, will take actions in fighting against climate change. And I hope um, the world leaders will hear, uh, hear the voices of the young, younger generations. And also, I hope that um, uh, we can all work together as one, uh, never mind if we come from different races or different countries, but as we are living in one planet, so we need to protect this planet for our future generations, because they are the people who are going to suffer from what we have done. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for engaging in this intergenerational dialogue. My family in Ghana and Uganda always tells me to know where you're going, you have to understand where you came from. And I think today has been a journey of understanding the deep crises and the deep levels of climate change that we're seeing, but also we've gotten to see where we can go through all of you. So thank you for your questions and your thoughtfulness. Again, this has been Zinclair Samal with Now This, and now I'm going to turn the floor over. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, thank you, thank you, excellencies. And Zinclair, and we are now going to transition into our official closing, but first, we had so many commitments and so many announcements and so little time. So we have two final ones for you that I am so excited to introduce. Um, first, from the UN Foundation, Chandler Green. Run down, Chandler. <laughs> Chandler? Hello. Come on out. It's fun up here. I don't know why nobody wants to come join me. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know if I... We can switch mics. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Chandler Green, and I'm with the United Nations Foundation. Uh, as a young person who works in climate change communications, I've noticed that the stories that we hear in the media focus way more on the problems than the solutions. In fact, in the United States, a study found that stories, media stories about climate change only discuss solutions just 13% of the time, just 13%. So how can we solve the climate crisis if people don't see and they don't understand the solutions. 
That's why this year, the United Nations Foundation, in partnership with National Geographic and Salesforce, we're teaming up to relaunch an award-winning Instagram campaign called Hashtag IonClimate that aims to share the perspectives of global photographers and young change makers just like you to change the way that we see climate change. So we want you to join us starting this October. We're gonna be asking you to share your solutions and this video is gonna tell you what it's all about. Hashtag Ion Climate. And second from the Act Now campaign, welcome Runa Ray. Hello everyone. I'm Runa Ray. I'm a sustainable designer from India. And this summer, Act Now has held the Food and Fashion Challenge, which has been spearheaded by the fashion and the other industry leaders. I'm truly honored to have partnered with the Act Now Fashion Challenge. And now, now I request all of you to please turn your attention to the Act Now video. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Tolu Olubumi, and I want to talk to you about an exciting United Nations campaign called Act Now, which helps you take climate action. We've all seen the devastating impact that climate change has on the planet and on our lives, but we're not always sure what to do. Through the Act Now Climate Campaign, the United Nations is encouraging everyone to take small, everyday actions that can make a big difference. To help us get the word out, we asked some very special friends to break it all down. Take a minute to watch this important message. We're all in danger. We need to put aside our differences and work together. I'm in. The birds and the pigs from the Angry Birds movie 2 are becoming frenemies in the important fight against climate change to protect our planet. The United Nations has a plan to help the Earth, and they need all of our help before it's too late. The Angry Birds movie 2 is working with the United Nations on the Act Now campaign. We need you to act now. Every choice we make matters. Every action we take counts towards protecting our planet. From the food you eat to the clothes you wear. How will you fight climate change? Here are some ideas to get you started. Try meat-free meals or eat more vegetables, nuts, and grains. I eat dirt. <laughs> Reduce your electricity use. Unplug and spend time outside. You are here, Give your clothes a second chance. Use old clothes for new looks. <clears throat> Drive less, walk more, and take public transportation. Hey, at least we're going to get all our steps in today. Recycle and reuse. Bring your own bags and use a reusable water bottle. We got it. Kind of your goal. Act now. Actua ya. Act now for a happy planet. Take part in the global movement. To save our world from being destroyed. What we really need is a hero. Actually, that position's been filled. Oh, yeah! Join the Angry Birds to make a difference. Go to un.org slash act now today and choose your action. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Working with what we got. Unite for a better world. You can cheer for that. Thank you, Angry Birds. Now that you know how it works, let's take climate action together. Grab your phones and go to un.org slash act now. 
While we're waiting to connect, here's a message from our Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed. From the food that we eat to the clothes that we wear, each of us has the power to confront the climate challenge. Go to un.org slash act now to log your actions for a healthier planet and a better future. Thank you, Deputy Secretary General. Hopefully you're all on the bot now and can see the 10 actions. Take a moment to find an action that you actually did today. No cheating or it won't mean anything. Think about the climate friendly choices you've made today. Did you take the train here? Maybe you brought a water bottle, used a tote bag for your stuff, or ate at one of the great vegetarian places around here. Log that action on the bot and share it with your friends on social media. Every action logged adds to the global count of actions that people all around the world have already taken. Together, we can change the world. Act now. Join the global movement for a healthier planet. Thank you. Awesome. And in the spirit of acting now, we have finally gotten this transition right. So I am so excited to enter into our official closing session for what has been a pretty incredible Youth Climate Summit. No? Have you? Been? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Youth mobilization, your mobilization, has been the driving force of conversation and action in these last months, as we've seen over the course of the day. So for the very last session of this summit, we want to give the floor to some young leaders who will share more ways to take action as we head toward Monday's Climate Action Summit, COP and beyond. So first, Rebecca Freytag. Rebecca, you've been spearheading a global petition called Hashtag All In for Climate Action. And I hear that you just surpassed one million signatures. What are young people calling for in this petition, and what do you hope world leaders will deliver in response on Monday? Thanks. Hello. Um, whom of you have been marching yesterday or have ever participated in a climate strike? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In, the, in this year, we were more than hundreds of thousands of people on the streets, and yesterday we were more than four million people. I think we have shown the world that we are very good at marching, at screaming, at shouting, but we are also very good at um, something else, which is we come up with concrete demands. We can be part of policy making. And um, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, told the world leaders to come up with real action plans and no boring speeches um, at the climate summit. And actually, I wanted the same. So this is why I've started the All In for Climate Action campaign on Change.org, where I connected the petitions and activities from people all around the world. Because I think that only collectively we have a stronger voice in addressing the leaders at the climate summit. And actually, collectively, um, we have started peti nine, 90 petitions from five continents, and we collected more than a million signatures that I actually got here on my stick with me. Ooh. We have countries <laughs> from a, a like Albania, Argentina, Afghanistan, to that, like Zambia. We organized strikes, we built up the pressure, we met decision makers. Because you know what, we are fed up with boring speeches and we are fed up with excuses. If we want a future on this planet, this is what we need to do. We need to remind the politicians on their responsibility to govern according to the will of the many and not the few individual profit-seeking individuals. So I think we need to continue to keep up the pressure on governments and on corporations. We need... We need to march more, we need to vote more, and we need to consume less. So let's try to get millions more to go all in for climate action, because we are all in for climate action, and now we want to see the world leaders to go all in for climate action as well. Thank so, you so much. <laughs> Next up, Katie Itter from the Global Climate Strike and Extinction Rebellion Action. Katie. You've been a key leader in the global climate strike movement, and yesterday was obviously massive. Tell us what happened and what's next for the movement. And you can take mine. Awesome. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Katie Eater. I'm from the US, uh, and I uh, run the Future Coalition, which is a network of youth-led organizations and youth organizers uh, across the United States. Uh, and we helped coordinate the uh, climate coalition that 
uh, planned the, the strikes here in the U.S., uh, made up of eight amazing youth-led organizations, a lot of whom are uh, represented here today. Uh, and our goal uh, with these strikes was to use the strikes as a vehicle to bring together the climate movement in the United States uh, and really not only create an intergenerational day of striking, um, but also make sure that you know we as young people in the U.S. and across the world are united in, in our mes mes message and our vision, and we really used the strikes yesterday as a, a launch of a new era of the climate movement, which I think we did definitely uh, a very good job of. Um, we had the largest turnout that we've had so far with uh, our, our climate strikes, um, with over 600,000 people striking across the country. So um, it was a very exciting day, and I think that there's a lot more to come. And you know, we're really now looking at and talking about how are we going to ensure that we make our movement more accessible and, and make our movement more diverse. You know, this um, the climate movement, though it's not super well represented here, which um, probably should be better, but um, you know, we, we must be uplifting uh, uh, the voices of, of people of color and uh, in the U.S. and across the world um, to ensure that we have diversity and representation in the climate movement, uh, and that we're you know opening up the table, and that we're including not just people who traditionally have been in the environmental movement, but uh, people of all different walks of life uh, to make sure that you know this is a movement that every single person can be a part of. Uh, so really excited for the next strike on November 29th, um, and uh, the the continuation of the the weekly strikes um, from here on out. Uh, um, yeah. Thank you so much. You can clap for that. And mark your calendars, November 29th. Next up, Fernando Garcia Crespo Santalo. You're a 19 year old from Mexico leading the people's platform for a livable future. Can you tell us about the goals of this platform? Yes. Uh, so uh, I will start first by continuing what uh, my friend and fellow colleague uh, from globally the platform uh, is, uh, said. Uh, we're going to strike again on November 29th. We're building a coalition between groups from Extinction Rebellion to, uh, to Fridays for Future around the world. And we're looking towards November 29th as Black Friday, and uh, we're going to shut it down. So uh, we think that in this case, we have overconsumption, and it is time that we create the amount of disruption and the amount of attention that is needed. So things are going to get rowdy. And uh, Show him how rowdy. <laughs> so the... The platform for a livable future, uh, it started a year ago when uh, I was sitting in a room in Washington, D.C., and I was thinking, how could we unite the global movement? How we, could we make sure that an action taken across the world from me could add to the same outcome that I wanted it to, to, to achieve? So I set myself to write a manifesto, a global platform of demands, a blueprint for a global Green New Deal. Uh, mirroring myself, uh, uh, basing myself on the idea of the SDGs, but taken to a level that was radical and inadmissible for a UN institution. Mm -hmm. So we basically said, how can we calculate NDCs for each country and tell activists in each country what their country's NDCs need to be? Because I, it's as much as my business what America emits as Americans it is, because a ton emitted in the United States affects me as much as someone in the US. And the same thing for the world. Climate change has no borders. So we've been working on that, and the same team that built that, we ended up deciding that we needed to unite our movement beyond that. And the only way we could achieve a common platform is if we had a common movement. So we started building coalitions with people from Extinction Rebellion, with people from Fridays for Future around the world, and we ended up cre creating a big group of people which uh, kind of fleshed out the idea of November 29th, and this is growing by the day. So we're very proud, and uh, look for us in the streets. And if you want to learn more, please talk to me afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando. Now, Lucky Tran, I think many of us know about March for Science, which is behind some of the biggest marches and protests we've seen organized over the last few years. And you're the managing director. So could you tell us how the movement is working to capture some of the practices and lessons learned? And what's next for you guys? Thank you. And first of all, I just want to say, I'm so humbled to be on the stage with so many amazing young leaders, and thank you to everyone in this room. So I am a scientist myself, I'm a biologist, I have a PhD from the University of Cambridge. I talk to so many scientists, and we are so thankful all for all the youth leadership. When you go to world leaders and say, you need to read the IPCC report, you need to listen to scientists, that is so fantastic. And that's what our movement is about. We started three years ago because 
something really absurd is happening is that scientists have been warning the world about climate change for decades. Actually, we've known about it for 200 years, really. <laughs> and, and we have solutions too. So we can't do any of this action. We can't achieve justice. We can't build a better future together if science is ignored or suppressed. And so what we're doing is um, on Earth Day next year, we ask everyone in the community, our community, to come up and stand up for science. We're going to have a global day of action on that day, three years after we first began, and it's also a historic day. Yesterday was a historic day, so amazing. 50 years ago was the first Earth Day where 20 million people flooded the streets for action, and we feel like it's important that we all come and join that again next year. So please join us on Earth Day next year. And the other thing is that we build better movements when we support each other and we, we learn from each other um, intergenerationally across countries, across continents. And so March for Science is going to put together a toolkit working with all of you leaders here. Um, and that's something to learn about lessons learned, how do we mobilize people, what are the best practices, and try to work with all of you so that we can really put that out there as an organizing guide so that we can keep building together. So please visit us in the SDG Media Zone tent um, if you haven't already today, and you can fill in um, some of the best practice that you've learned and we'll help put that together for you or get in touch afterwards. And Thank you so much. And if folks can't make it to the tent, where can they find out more about your toolkit and keep track of all yep. of this? Just on our website, marchforscience.org, and um, our toolkit will be first released in Chile later this year at COP. Amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. You, you can cheer for that. Thank you. And last but not least, actor, singer, and Goodwill Ambassador to UN Environment, designated as the youngest ever Goodwill Ambassador to the UN at only 14, Aidan Gallagher. Aidan, I hear you're on a mission to deliver a bunch of love letters to world leaders. I mean, the best question I can ask is, what is that all about? <laughs> <laughs> well, first I would like to start off by saying that not everyone is an expert, nor does everyone have the knowledge of what is going on in the climate crisis. That makes our first step education. However, what we do all have, thank you, <laughs> is a voice, and we have choices in how we consume, how we spend our dollars. Now, no one is powerless. Anyone can make a difference at any moment. Now, my commitment is to spread awareness about simple solutions that the people can take by acting now. The United Nations Environment Program recently launched an initiative called Beat Air Pollution on June 5th, World Environment Day, with the New York City Department of Education. And as part of this, excuse me, as part of this initiative, we reached out to children to write to global leaders letters expressing their wishes for a healthy planet. Now I have two of those moving letters here to read to you. They are from Arlo and Alexander. I'm so excited for Arlo and Alexander. Oh, you, you are bet. too, I can feel it. Oh, Aiden, you've got to hold it up to the camera. <laughs> All right. All right, so this, one, this first one's for Alexander. Alexander writes, Dear world leaders, the world has a problem that we are creating. That problem is fossil fuels. It's bad because the polar ice caps are melting, plus the Arctic. Now, we're also making global warming worse. So at the bottom of my heart, rise up and let's make a change. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you, Alexander. And as you can see, I'll try and show this on the board. Uh, Alexander draws of oil companies and factories polluting the environment. He draws of emissions from cars and children choking on this air pollution. The second letter. is from Arlo. Arlo writes, dear world leaders, our world is in danger because of pollution. 
if we keep polluting, the birds, the animals all over the world will die. And I really don't want that to happen. Some solutions that we have is to not use... Oh, what does he say here? Petroleum. There we are. There we are. And make plastics out of natural ingredients to get solar panels, electric cars, vehicles, and to reuse stuff. I like nature. I love it, he writes. I love to hike and surf and play in nature. And Arlo draws of butterflies, Tesla, windmills, palm trees, and birds. Now, I hope the world leaders today will understand that even the youngest among us are gravely concerned about the climate emergency and how it is changing our planet. So I urge all of you to take those concerns to heart, to act now. Thank you. Thank you to our incredible panelists. And we, can we clap them off because they were Amazing. And I love that you have literally heard from everyone, from the Secretary General to Arlo and Alexander, who illustrated their comments for us. Um, and now, go on. <laughs> You're all set. They were waiting to be dismissed. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. That was a wonder. And what a wonderful way to end, right, on those voices. Um, so, to close us out and kind of take us home, I want to welcome to the stage our two co-hosts of today's Youth Climate Summit. So welcome back the Youth Envoy, you know her well, and together with the Special Envoy for Climate Action, Luis Alfonso de Alba, to send us off. Thank you, Nadira. Thank you, Luis, also for the great partnership that you have extended in organizing this summit. Um, so I have a bunch of notes that I made during the day of the summit. I also tried to pop into some of the workshops and capture what you guys were saying. And it's kind of three pages long. So I'll try to be as brief as possible. Also, feel free to let me know if you agree with what I'm saying or if you are the one who said it, feel free to maybe give an applause. Um, so these messages uh, will be captured, these captured messages will actually go to the Head of State Summit through the youth speakers who will start the Head of State Summit on Monday, but we will also make every opportunity available to us um, to give these messages to the world leaders and the leaders who will be coming to uh, the UN headquarters in the coming weeks, uh, in the coming days to make their national and regional commitments and global commitments um, to stepping up climate action. So first of all, one of the very strong messages that we heard from most of you is that uh, the climate or the ecological crisis is uh, no, it's, it cannot be siloed into one area. It's an economic crisis, it is a political crisis, and it is an existential crisis. Uh, climate and environmental justice are a matter of human rights, was also a very strong message that was reflected throughout the day. 71% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions come from 100 companies, so we need to hold these companies and corporations accountable. 20 most powerful countries in the world are responsible for 80% of the global carbon emissions, so we need to make these countries accountable and responsible. Thank you. Those who are suffering from the impacts of climate change are not the ones who are contributing to it. So our people from the small island states in Africa, in Asia, in the Pacific, in Latin America and the Caribbean needs climate justice and reparations. I did a good job note taking. Young women and girls are disproportionately affected by climate change in their day-to-day -day lives, but also especially when disasters hit. Freedom of expression of young people must be protected and upheld. It was raised that not in every country it's safe for climate activists to protest, strike or d demonstrate online or offline. We should create safe spaces for climate activists to express their, themselves. 
The Paris Agreement is rooted in intergenerational equity, and you called upon the duty bearers and policymakers to respect these principles. Respect the rights of future generations, respect the agency of young people, and recall the Article 12 of the Paris Agreement that we need more climate education for young people. There was also a call that we need to understand climate change as an intersectional issue and treat it as an intersectional issue. There was a call for the need of credibility, especially when dealing and working with the fossil fuel industry, how their influence to politics is actually helping recreate a cycle of this uh, perpetration that we are talking about, and the need to stop subsidizing fossil fuel and also stop building new coal power plants. The call for young people to be included in the design, implementation, and reviewing of the NCDs, adaptation plans, and mitigation policies was also raised. More funding for youth organizations to develop their own solutions organized at the community level. Currently, there is a huge power balance, power imbalance between donors and youth organizations. To, so to level this power balance and to make more funding available for youth organizations to sustain and carry their work was raised. Also more platforms for young people to come together and for, to network, especially in climate uh, activism was also raised. The climate crisis is a crisis we can solve if we have the political will. This came from a lot of the speakers. We are facing a leadership crisis, some of you said. This cannot be solved by a project here and there from the governments or a CSR project here and there from private sector. We need systemic change, especially in our economic system. So with that, um, Monday we are hosting, the Secretary General is hosting with Lewis's support and leadership the Climate Action Summit with the participation of head of states. So today, this afternoon, you know, so there were so many amazing commitments made by young people, for young people. So there is an expectation that the elected leaders who are coming on Monday will also try to at least top these commitments and made commi make commitments themselves that can at least level the le level of commitment and ambition these young people have shown within this chamber today. The Last part is the continuation of this dialogue, uh, the need to take this conversation forward during COP25 in the Sustainable Development Goals uh, Decade of Action and continuing the engagement of young people in important discussions that affect climate action. So these are the main key messages that we heard from all of you during the workshops, the breakout sessions, the plenary sessions, and the speakers. And we hope that those leaders who were in the room and those uh, who are watching online and those who will be speaking on Monday will also take these messages and actually disseminate it to a wider audience. Um, before I end and pass it on to Luis to talk a little bit about how, how this is going to be taken forward, I just want to give a quick shout out to the main partners who helped us organize this summit. First of all, to all the young people who came here from all different parts of the world, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time, your commitment. The volunteerism, you have volunteered your time and your effort to come here to the work that you do in your countries. Thank you so much for that. I want to especially thank the co-leads of the Youth Engagement and Public Mobilization Track, Ireland and the Republic of Marshall Island. Thank you very much for your support and leadership. Also to Namibia and Nigeria, the coalition members for their support as well. A very special thank you to Luis uh, Alfonso Dialba and Sophie and their team. There are three very special people that I want to recognize who actually made this summit happen. Yasumin Ansari. <laughs> Alessandro. And Jonah. I don't see Jonah here, but uh, those three people were instrumental in making this happen. And also to the colleagues in my team who worked hand in hand with them to make sure that we make this day as impactful as it can. Uh, I also want to thank much for our, uh, Science, who supported us with SDG Media soon, Department for Global Communications for the support they extended, to the amazing interpreters who are working beyond their time. Thank you so much for the work that you did today. 
the Department for Conference Management who helped us get this room and prepare it the way that we wanted, which was a little bit different from the usual UN meetings. I also want to thank our uh, really cool security guards and colleagues from security who also helped us make sure that the meeting runs smoothly. Um, I also want to thank the UN Foundation a big thanks to UN Foundation. You have been instrumental in supporting us to pull this summit together. YMCA, thank you for organizing 91 global watch and do parties all over the world. All those who are watching us online through UN Live, thank you so much. Um, and I just want to thank um, by ending, there must have been mistakes made. Uh, we are not perfect. Please sending us your feedback, your comments. We are open to improving. We also find want to find ways to meaningfully engage young people in the work that the UN does every day. So tweet at us, email us, let us know how we can make this better. We are also in a journey of learning. So thank you very much for being here. And now I pass on to Luis. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I do not intend to hold you long. Let me just, after the, the very, the excellent uh, uh, summing, uh, summing up that uh, Judge Adma made, uh, first of all, recognize the work of uh, her team, my team, and most importantly, the work that you have all done during the day. I want to recognize particularly also the group, uh, the working group of the youth, uh, the 30 youth that help us organize in this event and participated very actively since Abu Dhabi, the preparatory meeting. But the main message I have for you is uh, the one that uh, we have been sharing with other stakeholders and other partners in the sense that this is the beginning of a process, not the end. And we will be collecting all the ideas, all the proposals, all the initiatives that have been discussed today. Many of them will be presented by you, by yourself, you uh, participants in the morning, uh, Monday session. But all of uh, others uh, are going to be uh, registered in our web uh, page and be followed by the United Nations. The whole family of the United Nations is uh, reorganizing itself to be much more supportive of action. The time for implementation has arrived. We all need to concentrate on that. We all need to share information, to share resources, and focus on that. Jajadma was already talking about the next stop, which is going to be COP25. Uh, but certainly, we will need to, to have several stops before the end of next year, by the, when the member states uh, need to come uh, to the COP26 with seriously enhanced NDCs, with increased level of ambition, increased uh, commitments, if we want to get back on track and avoid the increase in the temperature beyond 1.5 degrees. This is our goal, and I hope that you will remain engaged with us. We will do the follow-up, and we will hold accountable all, including the youth. I think we need to hold accountable each of us, and that's the only way that we will be able to move forward. Thank you very much for your participation. And don't go anywhere. Thank you, thank you, thank you, envoys. We have one incredible performance to end this amazing day. And you know you want to stay because one, I'll have reception instructions for you after. And two, it must be incredible because the DSG has returned to watch it with us. So. You can cheer for that. That's a demonstration of commitment for sure. So we have an awesome performing artist who's been a strong voice on poverty eradication, eradication and health and is going to come and just like rock us out into the end of the, of the Youth Climate Summit. Can I get one last cheer for the Youth Climate Summit, though? <laughs> Pretty amazing day. And with that, I want you to keep that energy going for Wajay.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Waje. I'm a musician from Nigeria. <laughs> That's my mama right there. <laughs> and I'm doing a song, I'm performing a song called Got Your Back. Now, this song, imagine that Earth is your friend and Earth is telling you these words. So please listen. Say friends are friends forever. True friends stick out for each other. Why you can't they act like say me are no matter? They say friends go day there for each other. Some of them stick closer than sisters Even though you know, say, I need you You know they bother But you know I got your back Like no one's ever had You're happy or you're sad Still I got your back I did with you right from the start Through the rain and through the dark But you know greed do me the same You see you don't have to be perfect Oh, just show me that you care These true friends are hard to find But I'm blessed I got you in my life But you too like to control You too act like say you too know Oh I know it's kind of hard to say Each other's way yeah. no matter what in your face I be your person every day cause you know I got your back like no one's ever had you're happy or you're sad still I got your back I did with you right from Start through the rain and through the dark, but you know, greed do me the same. Oh, you don't have to be perfect. Oh, you don't have to be perfect. Yeah, you don't have to be perfect. I just want you to. Believe in me, oh, oh, I beg you, make you try for me too. Hey, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. I just want you to believe in me. Cause you know I got your back Like no one's ever had You're happy or you're sad
feel I got your back I did with you right from the start Through the rain and through the dark So I beg you do me the same Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Give it up for Wajay! Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. It's, it's such a great honor to be here performing in front of you. And I got acquainted with the Green Wall, the Great Green Wall Project last year. And the whole idea is building walls, you know, planting you know, to save lives, because I've seen what this whole climate change has done to people in my country. And I just want to put, I want you to put your hands together for my brother, Amzat, because I know he has something to say quickly. And we appreciate you. Thank you. You back. Yes. <laughs> Africa is losing arid land. Over 400 million people go to bed hungry. Time is no longer on our side. Today, people are building walls that are not uniting us. People are building walls that are causing crisis among communities. But the Great Green Wall, it's about hope. It's about peace. And it's about uniting people and showing that truly we can curb climate change across the Sahel. Yeah. I want you all to join me on the stage, starting from the Deputy Secretary General. Because we must leave no one behind. And the movement must start now. Please, the UN Youth Envoy, the Special Envoy on Climate Change, and you all, we need everyone on the stage. We just have five minutes in the room, so I want to be mindful <laughs> of everybody that's here. Please come. So? Yes. Yeah. Please. Can we give a cheer for, for this bit of youth enthusiasm that we have going here? Thank you, thank you. I think Una Chaplin put it best. Thank you for standing up for what is right, what is true, what is beautiful, what is natural, and what is logical as well. Thank you, live stream audience. We are gonna see you at the reception on the fourth floor. Just go up to the delegates' dining room and we are gonna be hanging with you for the rest of the evening. <laughs>